Thank you for coming to the school committee meeting tonight in Indian Brook. Uh, please join us with the Pledge of Allegiance. We just had a great tour of the school. Um, Principal Harold sent us a, took us on a walking tour. We went out to the playgrounds, and that's loud, isn't it? Is that is that too loud? Uh, we went on the tour of the new playground and everything, and it's all looking really great. It's coming along really nicely. And so tonight, let's start with, is there anyone from the community that would like to address the school committee? And seeing no one, we'll move on to our North High School update. We don't have North, just South. Okay, Megan, South update. Um, so this week we started our AP testing and that'll go on for the next two weeks. Um, this Wednesday, we have a financial aid planning night, and I believe it starts at 6, 6.30. I'm not sure. Um, this Wednesday and Thursday, we have our PSHS drama theatrical review, which I believe that starts at 7 as well. Um, our junior prom is May 12th at Indian Pond Country Club. Um, May 12th is also the day that progress reports will be updated on Aspen and progress reports will be sent home for a student who has either a D or an F. Um, May 3rd is the National Honor Society general meeting and SATs are this Saturday for students who have already registered. Um, May 15th is the Student Council annual awards banquet and the senior so showcase for Plymouth South students is May 16th. And that's all for tonight. Oh, good night. <laughs> the next meeting, there'll be a lot of senior things. So then we have uh, old business. Now, um, if we don't have any immediate updates for old business, we're going to cover that at the next meeting. That'll be my last meeting as chair, so I want to make sure I leave it clean. <laughs> um, so... Next meeting, we'll go through all the old business. And now we're going to have an update from um, Dr. Sorensen on, our, on the NSBA annual conference. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, there's, there's a lot we could report on, but to save everybody, I think uh, Ms. Burgess and, and I have decided to focus in on just a couple of primary points. And so I will touch them. The, the first one is, and it's very, it's very uh, germane to where we are right now in politics in America, is that public schools across the country are under fire uh, for uh, a number of reasons. And the, at the conference, there was uh, several workshops on encouraging school, they call them school boards across the country. Of course, we're a school committee, but uh, the, um, there were several workshops on encouraging school boards and school committees, if they have never been active or if they have been moderately active, to now become very active to protect public schools. Um, and I'm going to share some of, some of the reasons why with you and some of the connections. Uh, uh, the ESSA, which is Every Student Succeeds Act, which is the, uh, which is the succeeding act of No Child Left Behind is being, uh, for lack of a better word, diminished and attacked. And one of the things, the reason why it's be beginning diminished is because the Obama administration never finalized the third and most important part of ESSA, which is the funding of it. And since it was never finalized, it leaves the next administration the opportunity to finalize the funding of ESSA. Well, the Trump administration has made it really clear that they have no intentions of funding ESSA. Now, that will hurt districts all across the country. So the, the National School Board Conference is encouraging us to speak to our Washington representatives as they consider 
the funding on ESSA, obviously to encourage them to continue to, to fund that particular act. Now, the number is 90% of the country is educated through public education. But if ESSA isn't funded as, as the Obama administration had hoped it would be, that money is going to be filtered off in the billions of dollars for voucher programs. Now, we know the Supreme Court in 2002 found the constitution constitutionality of voucher programs. But since 2002, there is very strong data now showing that voucher programs are not accomplishing what they should have accomplished. Three particular states, Indiana, Ohio, and Louisiana, are complete voucher states. And the achievement levels of students who were in public schools, who took the voucher and moved over to a private school or a charter school, their percentile scores have dropped from 50% to 26%. And there's a lot more data to support the fact that vouchers are not working. However, the current administration continues to put forward opinions and proposing bills to take billions of dollars from the voucher program. The federal government currently funds every single IEP written in this country at $1,777, which is a mere amount of the cost of every IEP. The money that's going to be taken from public education over to a voucher programs will drastically cut that number, as well as many others. Now, I have already a uh, uh, couple of, uh, I have already written to, uh, in fact, in my apologies to the committee. I, I thought we were going to speak to this issue at a previous meeting, so I took it. but from myself as a committee member to our Washington representatives, pretty much saying that, that uh, it's critically important that they pay, they pay special funds for public education. Now, there are a couple of websites that I want to rec suggest to you. Uh, the, uh, there's a website called Center for Public Education, and it's the National School Board Action Center .org the National School Board Action Center.org. If you go on that website, which I did, you can get all the updates on the bills that are being proposed, the opinions being rendered, and given opportunities to write and have that through, through the National School Board Conference, uh, through the National School Board, given the opportunity to s send a letter to your representative. They actually give you a letter on that site. M my recommendation would be, and everybody would, recommend the same thing, to compose your own rather than take the standard letter. And by the way, I did get a response from all three of our representatives having done that. Uh, the second area is the last reauthorization of IDEA occurred, occurred in August 2004. So we're 13 years without a reauthorization of uh, IDEA, and that is coming up for consideration. And here again, the current administration feels that the states should begin to pick up responsibilities that the federal government have been funding over the years. And uh, oh, that just reminds me that, uh, oh, on the uh, very contemporary, and that's why I wrote letters recently, the affordable, no, the American Health Care Act is proposing to take funding that went to Medicare to put it back to the states. Medicare, Medicare that was used in education for students with disabilities, students with hearing losses, students, students who have real special needs. Uh, IDA was paying, would pay a, a chunk of that through that funding. Now, the, if, if Medicare goes back to, to the states, education will be competing with all the other organizations who want that Medicare money. And uh, the National School Board feels very strongly that we should be encouraging that that language in the American Health Care Act be stricken. So that's that one area. The second one I want to talk about in a little bit, in a, a little bit briefer, but equally important, is not even is totally different. One of the one of the workshops that I went to uh, was uh, the retooling 
and revamping of physical education. The reason why I chose that workshop to go to was because, you know, we're, we're looking carefully at our health curriculum. And as you look across the, uh, the United States, a few states have revamped their health curriculum and included the revamping of physical education. And I can summarize the changes, and there's some websites you can go to if you want to read about it, but the, the main difference in what's happening in, in physical education uh, in those states that have passed the changing of the curriculum is to not have students compete against other students on a broad base basis. In other words, the idea of having a stopwatch and timing a student how fast he runs around the building or uh, who's going to win the 200 meters. The, the emphasis, now, emphasis now is on students competing against themselves physiologically, knowing their own body mass, knowing their own heart rate, knowing their own blood pressure, uh, and a few others. And there's a lot of good technology out there where, where for example, the, the gym class that I observed, uh, students were wearing what we would call a Fitbit, but there are other companies that make them. Now, the teachers give out this particular piece of technology. The student puts it on. And on the wall in the gym are the numbers of all the Fitbits. Now, you, you only know your own number. Nobody else knows your number. And you can see, as you watch yourself go through the activities of the day, your vital signs changing and the colors change. And the encouragement is to teach children to get their respiration and heart rate up to a certain workout level and hold it there. And they can track that over the entire school year. And the, the data that we, the, the schools that have done it are saying these kids are so excited about being able to maintain their heart rate and respiration at a rate that's good for their body, as opposed to beating their buddy in dodgeball, as opposed to uh, hitting a, uh, you know. The gym classes still do those things, but the emphasis is moving away from those things towards towards that, that level of education. Just, a, just a, quick, a quick couple of points from that, and then I'll give the floor to Mrs. Burgess. Uh, for example, I'm going to outdated PE programs, skills and rules to play the game. The enhanced PE program is physical competence and cognitive understanding about physical activities so students can be active, so students can be active for a lifetime. Another one outdated PE programs, skill-related comparison to national norms, enhanced PE programs, emphasis on health-related fitness components. Students engage in self-testing, applying principles of fitness designed for individual uh, development. Two others, grading, outdated PE programs based on attendance, whether or not you get dressed for gym, your skill level, and your fitness scores. Enhanced PE programs based on self-improvement, self-evaluation, peer assessment, and skill rubrics. Finally, the technology for outdated PE programs is a stopwatch. The technology for enhanced PE programs, computers, pedometers, heart rate monitors, and other fitness technology. And final point on this, the gym class I noticed, they took their Chromebooks and they put them on stands, eight stands across the gym. Students put on the Fitbit. They would go to the first Chromebook, and let's say the Chromebook is a jogging video that they're watching. As they jog, they see themselves on the Chromebook jogging, and if a tree falls in their way, they have to jump over the tree, and they'll see themselves jump over the tree and make the turn. And when they finish that, they go to the next Chromebook, and this one might be swimming in the air, and you see yourself in the pool, and you're doing this, and you have to get to the end. It, it was fascinating. The kids were so excited about it. And the final point was interesting. The athletes had the hottest time with it. They had the hottest time getting their respiration and their heart rate up to where it needed to be because their bodies are quite different. So I think, if, and the reason why I picked this workshop, if we're doing, if we're doing health, we, we ought to consider looking at PE as well. And I met with Dr. Campbell last week or the week before to see, to his, to see his thoughts on this. I don't know if you had a chance to look at it since then. Say, at the secondary level, I think we've seen some adjustments to our physical education curriculum to be more in tune with that, but not to that degree, Dr. Sorensen. So certainly, I, and I agree, um, our health, a comprehensive health framework as a state has not been looked at since 1999. 
So we're, we're going, I mean, our framework is old. So um, there's, there's not a lot of emphasis there at the state level with that. Um, but certainly, as you pointed mm -hmm. out, we're looking at our health. We're looking at our comprehensive health, which should include physical education, too, because I th see the two of them working mm -hmm. hand in hand, mm -hmm. of course. So um, I welcome that information. Thank you yeah, for that. The, uh, we'll the, the, the states that have adopted this change, were, it was adopted at the state level. It wasn't adopted at the district level. Right. Yes, the whole, yeah, right, Illinois. So, so Illinois, right. for example, yes. passed a state regulation, a right. house bill, to, to change PE in, PE in the country, I mean in the state. So, oh, one final point. This is for, uh, pass this down to, uh, 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 <laughs> that girl right there. No, no, she, <laughs> no, you keep it. It's for you. Oh, thank no, you. Not Kim. Michelle. Michelle, yep, thank, thank you. you. Michelle. <laughs> this organization, like this organization tracks alumni. Oh. Now, I'm sure it's a fee, but they had some really interesting ways of how they track uh, alumni for your alumni association. Instead of harassing them. Yeah, we don't want to go there. <laughs> what, what? Just as yeah. long as it's better than, yeah, we do. We need a little GPS on all their little heads. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Keep on uh, tabs on our, our, our graduates, you know. Yeah. And I had one final point that, about uh, one of the sessions I went to, but it has to do with school safety, and I'd rather reference it in, in uh, executive session. Anyway, um, well, I went to certain things, but one of them that uh, was interesting for, for Patrick at the cafeterias is um, they have a composter and uh, also it takes the trays and compacts them, two separate machine, and it makes it into compost that we can use like in the schools for school gardens. So, but it takes a, the whole massive amount of garbage, the day's garbage, and it gives it into half a pail of something. It's amazing how, how it does it. But anyway, so I brought back the information so that they can go, go through it. Um, I'm not going to expound on it because it's for them to, to decide. Then I just went to a, a, a round table that I was invited to, and it was very interesting because it was called Segregation Then and Now, and it was a conversation about school resegregation in America. And I'm going, wow, what is this? Because it's just so different a, th a th topic. So I went in, and there was mostly, um, th the room was quite full, but it was mostly people from um, the, the cities. And um, for instance, I think it was St. Louis said uh, that 53% of, because of white flight, and all that happened with the segregation. So they have 53% Hispanic, 38% black, and the other 9% is uh, a combination of things, including white, but there aren't that many. So it was quite an interesting discussion because I hadn't even thought about that. And I don't know if Boston's that bad or not, but whatever, around the country, it was really terrible. New Jersey, uh, St. Louis, uh, a lot, a lot of them. It was, it was a very interesting uh, thing. But anyway, I just thought that's just food for thought because it was just never thought of before. Jim and I both went to this. Um, we didn't know that each other was going, but we ended up on this field trip for um, counterterrorism. I was really excited about it because um, I felt that uh, terrorism really isn't going to go completely away, and that I think it's a good career uh, on computers and all for uh, uh, kids to learn in the tech program. So I was really happy to go and, and see about it. But the um, museum and all that we went to, it started at 9-11, and they haven't progressed to the point that I, it wasn't, it, it hasn't been there long enough, and it hadn't progressed to the point that, that I um, thought it was. And um, they do have training, and it's a lot of it about it is about the police force, and they've done a lot of it in Colorado and all. But um, they also have teachers on the staff that are, are teaching teachers about it. But there's no curriculum or anything like that. I mentioned it to Ann Flino when we were on the bus that I was uh, kind of underwhelmed at what there was for offerings. And she said, oh, but there's a school in uh, North Carolina that does it and does it well. And she's given me that information, and I've written to her for that. 
I, I wrote it on a scrap of paper and it disappeared in my pocketbook somewhere. But anyway, I'll get it from her. And uh, so that we can, uh, can look at that for the, for the Vogue Tech program. I, I think it's a good thing. I think it's a, it'll be a good paying job. I think, you know, it's worth, worth looking into. So that's where that is. And then the thing that I was really the most excited about and didn't know about ahead was the Acellus <coughs> uh, bot. It's this little robot. He stands about yay high. And, but anyhow, there's, Acellus has many, many, many programs. But I was uh, really excited about the one for um, elementary kids that were uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth grades uh, for, that had autism. Because a robot is less threatening and it brings out the personality in them and they can talk to the robot. And the robot has um, uh, Bluetooth in him. <laughs> and uh, let's see. The robot himself is only $199, actually. But I thought that it was uh, a great thing because they can they code it. And then if they make a mistake in the coding, it moves to the side and the robot. The robot's very not, very unthreatening and speaks to them in a very nice way to get them to, to recode it and go again. And um, so I think that it's a, it's a great, great thing, a great tool to get yeah, for autistic kids to get, get out of themselves a little bit, but also to train them for a future career that I think that would be good because they're very bright, very bright. So um, they also have a program for, um, and <clears throat> the man didn't get into it, but we should look into it, for Down syndrome kids. So I, I think they do, they have many programs of all levels. It's a nonprofit institution. They do offer grants. We missed this grant that was up, but I think that we, going forward, we could do something about it. And I don't think it would be that much money to at least do the autism kids to start with and then see what we can do. But that's what excited me the most about it. And um, they said something about the, the program changes when it's laid down or, 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 or changed its position. Uh, there's all kinds of things with him. And it was very, very interesting. And, uh, but anyway, uh, let's see if there was anything on there that I should have said about it. Oh, also, they have a camp for, for teachers that, that's a three-day camp that uh, will train them to, to be able to do this. So uh, anyway, that's the Acellus. So that's what I have, so. Good. But did you guys find that the uh, keynote addresses and the other well, that's the one breakout I sessions were? Yeah, well, one of those, that resegregation was a breakout. Was a breakout. Yeah, yeah. But the, the keynote, they had, um, yeah, they had uh, Scott Kelly there. And, and the interesting thing, I mean, he talked about his experiences and everything, but, and he has a book out. But um, and, and for people that don't know, he's the astronaut. He's the astronaut, right. But what I didn't know is his twin brother was an astronaut. Right. And so he's just been up almost one year recently. He's been up yeah, almost he set a one record, year. Right, yeah, the it, right. But th what they did was, because his brother's also an astronaut, and th so they compared being in space that long with all of the tests and everything they're doing on him, they're doing on his brother, to see how, how being in space affects a person. So that, that was a very interesting part of it. Because they're I mean, identical on, twins. On, 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 uh, yep. <laughs> on Scott Kelly's uh, on Scott Kelly's uh, keynote address, uh, as we listened to it, I, I thought if, if the National Association of School Boards taped that, uh, we, we could, his talk was so excellent, it could be shown to our high schools. Because the point he made over and over again was I was a nothing student. I wasn't doing well in school. I didn't have an interest in life. I didn't know where I was going. And uh, he takes you through the steps in a really, really good talk. Yeah about how we got to be this astronaut. And I might add, I, I belong to the Boston Lecture Series, and next year, one of the speakers is his brother. So his brother's <laughs> gonna be in Boston next year That'll be good. with his wife, uh, 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 Gabby, uh, Kelly. Gabby. Gabby, yeah. Um, I, wonder, I wonder if there would be some way to get 
him down here to talk to the school district because wow, that uh, would be great. Yeah. It, would be, it would be amazing. Also, there's a, a new word for you, endurance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a new word for next year already. A new word. No, but there was another one that I saw too. That, oh, I forgot what it was. Uh, well, anyway, there was another new word I had. We had too. I'll come back. I'll come up with it. So, did you just find that? Uh, between the keynote addresses, the breakout sessions, the vendor displays and everything, was it worth it for yeah. us? Was I it think so. I, I mean, yeah. I, did you think so? Absolutely. Yeah, sometimes Good. I don't, but this time I, I felt I did. Yeah, I could Good. find things. Excellent. I actually That's exactly could. what we want to hear. Yeah. yeah. Anybody so, have uh, any questions, follow-ups? Oh, it was elevate, the other word. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Thank you for the update. Elevate also goes into inspire. Yeah, yeah, elevate. <laughs> well, he's got a lot of pressure on him because he has to top it every gonna, year. Yeah, I know. That's <laughs> what I'm trying to trying to help him out. <laughs> oh, you have. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. So then, uh, new business. Anybody have anything they want to suggest for new business? Okay, then we have uh, reports and proposals from the superintendent, Dr. Maestas. Yes, tonight I have a few things to report. Um, earlier today, I had a visit with the staff at Plymouth South High School to uh, introduce the uh, new high school principal at Plymouth South High School, and I'd like to have Jim Hanna come to the table for a little bit. Um, <laughs> I just want to say a, a couple words and then I'll give Jim uh, the opportunity to address the committee. Uh, as you all know, we have been uh, going through a, uh, an exhaustive process to, to find a new principal for Plymouth South High School. And we had an, uh, a great um, process. Uh, Dr. Campbell helped uh, quite a bit with that. Uh, a number of people um, were part of those interviews and uh, we had final interviews last week had the opportunity to sit with uh, three finalists and come to the decision after a, a lot of uh, discussion that Mr. Hanna uh, would be the next principal. And I will tell you that Jim has been uh, very dedicated to the Plymouth Public Schools. He's a biology teacher for us at Plymouth South High School. He became a, a housemaster assistant principal, uh, freshman academy, and recently he's the vocational principal for uh, <coughs> Plymouth South High School. I did mention to the staff today that it's very unique that you have a candidate that has uh, the academic background and also the vocational background to actually look at both programs and lead a school that has a comprehensive vocational school within. So we're very pleased with the process. I want to thank the committee, uh, the community members that actually uh, were, that were um, on that first committee, and also students were involved, and uh, it was. Uh, I'm sure Jim is uh, is glad the process is over uh, because it was very stressful for everyone involved. Um, but uh, a great deal of credit goes to to Jim for his preparedness. Uh, Jim, um, I to be honest with you, I really didn't even think Jim was going to apply a month ago. I had no no idea, and for him to. Um, be in the mindset and frame of mind to come forward and prepare and demonstrate to a variety of different groups that he had the energy, passion, dedication, and the visioning for the new high school is uh, a credit to uh, his, his willingness to, to lead that building. So with that said, uh, Jim has a, um, some big shoes to fill, but more importantly, as I told Jim, that he has to lead that building and has to lead that building to new heights. So with that said, I, I will turn it over to Mr. Hanna to address the committee. Thank you, Dr. Maestas. And um, the committee has had the opportunity to have me speak to you numerous times on our wonderful challenges that we've faced and, and overcome and active plans that we've done and action plans that we've done in vocational technical education. but. The opportunity for me to speak uh, to the committee as well as the interview committee, uh, Dr. Maestas, Mrs. Fry, Dr. Campbell, 
along with a lot of others, including our coordinators and parents and students. I could talk about curriculum and, and where we want to go and all the wonderful things that takes place at Plymouth South High School for days because that's what I know, that's what I love, that's what I've learned. And I've been so very fortunate to have obviously worked with so many great people. Obviously, I've learned a tremendous amount from, from Patty Fry. This year, especially, our administrative team has had to grow that much closer and tighter and rely on one another. Mr. Fornishari has certainly given us an opportunity to branch out within the building even more so than we have in the past. I've learned so very much completing my 24th year in the district, and it's truly something that I have a passion for. Plymouth South High School has been nothing but my home, away from home for all this time, and it's certainly something that I'm very proud of. I'm honored and humbled by the support that I received, not only from people that are sitting in this room, uh, but also from people, staff members, and of course my family. Uh, it's truly an honor. I look forward to the challenge. I have a tremendous amount of ideas and a vision that I think is very, very much centered around what that building was designed for. As you know, the vocational technical programs are going to be completely immersed throughout the building. And if you look at the philosophy and goals that were written by Mrs. Fry to the MSBA, you'll note that highlights about team and collaboration, just bringing it to the next level, more so than what we even do now from both the academic and the vocational technical side is truly something that I have a vision for. Not to mention the simple fact that what a community resource this is gonna be. It's gonna be f phenomenal. And I had the chance to walk the building the other day and it's, it's breathtaking, absolutely breathtaking. So I look forward to it. Again, I'm honored. I thank Dr. Maestas for this opportunity. And as I told him the other day, I certainly know that he's been there for us 24 seven, as he always has been. And I certainly appreciate the opportunity to work with him and certainly lean on him for as much guidance as I can. And I'm sure that Mrs. Fry will have a few um, ideas for me <laughs> as well. Um, but obviously, Dr. Campbell and I have also talked quite a bit about our views on curriculum and development and where we want to go from here. And I think the coordinators and I are all on the same page as well, which is certainly, um, certainly a blessing. So again, thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, in celebration, we'll give you the keys to a brand new school. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of responsibility. Just, just uh, you know, Mr. Begley, just one last yes. point that um, came to mind when, when uh, Jim was talking, and I really didn't think too much about this, but Jim spends part of his day in his current position at North High School. And I think it was important to realize that the, um, and I, I think Jim really believes this, is that the partnership and the and the collaboration of our two high schools is, is really important, and 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 we will continue to build that. And I think Jim has been able to see that from both sides, uh, and I think that lends a unique perspective. So we we hope that that will um, offer mm -hmm. more and more opportunities for us to to work together. Yeah, then that, that's a great point. I'm very fortunate to have a close working relationship with the administration and, of course, many of the faculty over at Plymouth North High School. And uh, it's certainly uh, Ms. McSweeney and myself have a, a very common view on, on vocational technical education completely immersed in with our regular academic setting. And I think that certainly uh, brought us closer together and, and obviously an ability to work well together. So I certainly... Um, I'm look very fortunate to be in that situation already with uh, with Plymouth North. Very good. Well, Great. thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, do we plan to fill the vocational yeah. uh, principal's position? Yes. yes. Um, I was asked that question today, and one of the concerns that the staff had when I visited with Plymouth South High School is that they understand that there are significant roles of the vocational uh, director, administrator, and there's significant roles of the building principal. Uh, so uh, Assistant Superintendent Fry and I discussed that early tonight, and we're going to post that as soon as possible. OK? Yep. We have to, right? Isn't yes, we do. It was it's a state a requirement yeah, that we had statute, to have. Yeah. Yeah. So does that 
said, we'll move on to the next item. I'm going to move things around. I have one other item to report, but I'll do it after. We have some other guests here tonight, and I, I want to get them uh, up, up to, the, to the table. Um, so I know last school committee meeting, I had the opportunity to inform the committee that um, a organization here in town, a business here in town, has been very generous to the Plymouth Public Schools. And we're generous um, is, is probably a, a light word because um, the minute they uh, went into to the New Plymouth South High School, I gave them a tour of the building. They invited me over to their, to their business, their shop. And the similarities of, of one of our new programs, which is our auto body, auto tech program, um, they, they were just so excited to know that our students in Plymouth will have the opportunity to train and, and potentially work in their business environment. And not only in their business environment, but other businesses in the community and surrounding communities that really need their, their skills, these skills. So when um, I went to visit, uh, Dave um, and Kevin were, were just so excited to um, build this partnership between the schools and their business, which we do a lot with vocational education. And uh, they offered two pieces of significant equipment which are very expensive. Uh, they have donated a, a frame machine. Uh, and what a frame machine does is when you have a collision in a vehicle and your frame gets out of alignment or it gets bent, you put it on this machine and it, it, it just bends it back into shape. And, um, and it's, it, it doesn't sound scientific, but I can tell you a body man believes it's scientific because it, there's measurement involved and it's very comprehensive. The machine they donated was on their floor um, and, and they offered that to us. And of course, we took it. Um, the next uh, piece of equipment is a tire balancer. And I love this stuff. So uh, the, the tire balancing, it's not the tire balancing of, of, of years past. I mean, this is a laser. Um, uh, th this machine has a laser on it uh, that will allow you to I know exactly where to place the, the, the weights on the tire. Um, but what's really important with this technology is these are the kind of tools that will be used in the trade. So our kids will learn it in school and they will then apply it when they get that job, which, is, which really is the, the, the end result of significant savings to the district and to the project. So we didn't have to go out and buy a frame machine and we didn't have to go out and buy a tire balancer. So the total of, of these two pieces of equipment is over $26,000. And that's actual, that's not new price. That's exactly what the, if we were to go out and buy them today, that's what we'd have to pay for these pieces of equipment. So with that said, I'd like to have uh, Kevin and Dave uh, come up if, if you don't mind. Um, and I'm not sure, Dave, I know you're not short for words, so I'm not sure if you want to say something, you can feel free. if. No, I'd like to thank the committee and uh, Dr. Maestas for the opportunity uh, to partner with them. <clears throat> the, um, currently, at the mechanical shop, we've got um, two students from Plymouth um, South yeah. that are working in the field, doing a good job, uh, and they've come up through the ranks, and they're on the way up. Mm -hmm. One of the students is extremely, uh, really good. And they're both very good, one's really good. Um, on the body side of the thing, Kevin will tell you that probably all of his um, technicians have come from trade schools. So there's a need, and I think bringing this program in, the auto body program, is significant because uh, there is a huge need for uh, auto body techs. And um, I'm sure Kevin can fill you in on that side of it. Um, I also was glad to hear the part about the immersion and the fact that we really need to teach these kids to read and write because, you know, they, they always used to say back in the day, and I think they still do, well, he really doesn't read and write that well, but he's good with his hands. Well, it's all technical now. We're using scanners that are very uh, complicated, and it's, uh, you really need to be almost an engineer to fix some of these cars. So I'll uh, give Kevin the mic, and he can say a few words, but thank you. Uh, yeah, we, we just, we're very excited that the uh, school's taking on the collision program. I mean, I'll keep it short, but average age of a body tech right now is almost 50 years old. Those guys are going to be retiring soon. We've been growing a lot lately. We need techs. Um, I've been chasing kids at Upper Cape just because that's the closest collision program I can get to. So I'm psyched that Plymouth's going to take on a collision program 100%. And, 
you know, you guys needed a frame machine. We saw you didn't have one. We want to make sure we got one in there. So that, uh, at least if it's not, that, that machine's the older machine. Time machine's new, but the frame machine's older. But at least the kids can learn some theories, practices on how to pull metal in cars. And um, so, yeah, we're very excited. We want to get involved. We'll be on the um, advisory committees and boards, and hopefully we can get some co-op students in there, like, next year, like, ASAP. I just want to get some young kids in there, and uh, hopefully they can be you know, lifelong Cape Auto employees and Plymouth residents, so it's all good. Thank you. All right. It's, it's excellent. Thanks. And, you know, the vocational program doesn't work unless we can get local businesses like Cape Auto to support it the way you guys have supported it. That's why when we first heard about this last week, we wanted to make sure you came in. We didn't want to just say thank you, you know, and we wanted you to come in and, and actually give you some. Dr. Sorensen wants to ask a question. And I know you have a thing. Uh, I heard you, Kevin, Kevin and Dave, thank you very much on behalf of the committee. Uh, Kevin, I heard you say just a few minutes ago that the average age of an auto technician is 50 years old, so you know those people are going to be retiring out and you're going to need young blood, and I, I think this uh, connection that we, we're establishing is so critically important, not only for the industry, but obviously for our students. But my question is, cars have become so complicated that, you know, I used to do cars too. He probably did cars as well. I open my hood now and say, what is that thing underneath there? I have no idea what those things do anymore. So, so my question is, the level of education that we have to provide our students in this field, uh, you guys can provide, con you, they can consult with us. You, you guys need to consult with us so that as, we, as these programs develop, you know better than anybody what these kids need to learn. It's, it's no longer changing spark plugs. No. No, I mean, um, the professors, you know, the, the people that teach at the school, they've got a good handle on it. Um, I know some of the people that teach there, Randy and some of the others, mm -hmm. they, they know what they're doing. The problem is they, you don't have the money to give them the tools to learn on. I, I shouldn't say you don't have the money, but it's well, now like, we have you, Dave. In, well, <laughs> you know, but I, like, also, I also think there's too much information. They got to learn the basics in school. There's almost too much information for them to get out of school and know. It's pretty a tough. Lot. There's just so much, and we continue yeah. it. We have programs in place at both shops, the mechanical shop and the uh, collision center. Where we actually, they have to do so much yearly training with us um, that you know we take care of that. But then we also pay them. Uh, different bonuses and different pay structures based on how much uh, schooling they go and what they and um, what they can do, what yeah. they learn, what they can do. We have a very good system for prodding them into learning more, and and if they're better techs, they're going to do a better job for us, which is a better job for the customer, which is a better job for everybody. So everybody makes more money, everybody works better, but um, the the amount of scanners that we have just at my shop, it's 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 crazy. We've got factory scanners for all these different vehicles and as an independent it's tough because we can't buy them all but we have a lot of different scanners. The last part of my question is are there fundamental sort of rudimentary basic things that kids need to learn? I mean we still have to have brake jobs, we still have to straighten out frames, I mean there are still things like that. Yes? It's changing as fast as that cell phone that you have has changed in your pocket you know they kick what are they up to number six or number seven on the iPhone? Seven. Right? They change like every okay. six months. The cars are changing that fast. We're having a rough time keeping up with it. It's hard. And um, they're constantly going to school and we're constantly learning. And in some cases, we're learning. The body shop gives us a lot of very new cars to fix um, because that's the kind of cars they get in that are smashed up. And it, they come to our mechanic shop, and we have to learn how to fix some of these cars. I'm not saying learning while we're experimenting, but it's. Sometimes it takes us longer to fix it, and we don't get paid for it, but we look at it as it's a learning experience f from our standpoint that, okay, now that we know how that works, the next one won't take three hours mm -hmm. to do. Like this uh, crash avoidance stuff is tough, but Blind spots, we're figuring yeah. it out, and we're educating ourselves basically in the field. The um, there's schools, but there's not as many schools as you'd like to see. But um, so we, need, we do need intelligent kids, though. Yes. Yeah. And the partnership between the school and us is great. So. Well, th we this was perfect. And I asked um, Dr. Maestas last week to try to give you a little something more to say thank you. And I have a plaque that the kids made for you. Oh, cool. Great. Thank you.
Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Rich, do you want to do a picture? Yeah. Can we do a picture then? Sure, sure. Uh, no, go ahead. No, it's your, it's your last. Uh, <laughs> yeah. They won't recognize you, Mr. Begley, with the. The last thing I have to report on tonight, I know some of you have heard, um, I know through uh, different agencies and, and news outlets, um, a, a news spot and, and also some concern regarding the uh, 13 Reasons uh, Netflix uh, series that's out there. And uh, this series is based on a, a book, 13 Reasons, by Jay Asher, and it was published well over 10 years ago, and, and it's a book that we're, we're familiar with. We've, we've had it in our, in our libraries. Um, but Netflix has taken uh, the premise of the book and has created a, a series uh, um, uh, around it, which is, has some really um, tough content. And one of the things that we were concerned about is there's a theme of, of self-harm, of self uh, which, which is in, embedded in, in that theme. So, um, one of the things that we were inundated, inundated with last week was uh, a number of, of concerns we had from administrators and, and teachers and parents and, and also uh, some of the organizations that support us, the National Association of Second Middle School Principals, elementary principals, um, regarding, you know, can we at least give resources to parents uh, if, if they do have conversations with, with their children at home and they are watching this, they can at least have the ability to have a conversation. So earlier today, uh, we sent out um, two different letters, a, a letter that is uh, geared towards elementary and then another one that's geared towards secondary, and those went out just to give parents information regarding um, the show that is that is that uh, seems to be very popular. Um, I have not uh, watched it. Um, I have heard, um, I know a number of, of people have, um, but I just want our, our, um, our parents to to know that we are aware of it and we wanted them to have some level of resource to be able to handle questions that may come up. So we did send something home that did have reference information that you can go online and pull down, pull down some information that they could use um, to be able to have conversations with their kids if, if it did come up. So um, with that said, Mr. Begley, that's all I have on my report. I know it's a little long tonight, but. Oh, oh right. good, thank you. <clears throat> so next we have, uh, this is Fry. Yeah. Retirements. Retirements. We have um, two additional retirements. Um, Kathy Chalice, who's been a grade two classroom teacher at Federal Furnace for 17 years, and Kimberly Simonson, I'm an ELL teacher at Nathaniel Morton Elementary School for 25 years. Very good. Ms. Badger. On behalf of the Plymouth Schools, I'd just like to wish these two individuals um, a happy retirement and thank them for their service to the district. Very good. Correspondence, Ms. Hunt. Sending. No. Nobody's no. sending us anything. No. In meetings. <laughs> we have no letters. Oh boy. Everybody's online. Yeah, everybody's <laughs> online. So that brings us to our uh, first program update, which is the school improvement plan for Indian Brook Elementary. And we have Principal Harold here tonight. Dr. Maestas, would you like? Tonight we are here at Indian Brook Elementary. And I want to thank uh, the Indian Brook community and Mr. Harold for. Uh, inviting the school committee and, and having us here. And we are at that period of time where uh, Indian Brook is going to update us on their school improvement plan. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Harold. Okay. Um, good evening and welcome. Uh, thank you to come to Indian Brook. I enjoyed giving you the tour and uh, showing you the many things that have happened over the years at Indian Brook. I um, kind of apologize. I'm going to start with an apology. I know. <laughs> 
we were hoping that we were actually going to um, be able to use our new technology that you can see behind you. We had the screen down. We have the short throw installed, but trying to configure it in the this room was a little difficult, so we had to reconfigure it. So unfortunately, the slide presentation is a little small, a little hard to see, so uh, my apologies for that. But um, um, I wanted to start by giving you an update or, um, of our last uh, improvement plan, which concludes at the end of this school year. Um, oh, if you would, I know. Will it work? Oh, it does. It's a little hard to see. Um, what I wanted to update first is uh, our first two goals, which were looking at ELA and mathematics. The reason I can kind of combine them, even though um, the material, of course, vastly different between the two, the ELA as well as the mathematics, um, we are using a differentiated workshop model. Um, and I know during our tour, I kind of showed you some of the classroom configurations that truly support that design and that differentiation that's taking place daily by the teachers. So it's really a, a phenomenal um, um, structure. We've been using it here for many years. Uh, it started um, oh, approximately eight, nine years ago when we started looking at spaces and how do you configure classrooms to accommodate um, our, our students and provide them the supports necessary. So. Um, I'm really excited where we are and what we've done and what we've accomplished. And as I said, um, the teachers, um, both Mrs. Canducci and Ms. McKenzie, who are going to speak on different components during the course of tonight, will kind of highlight some of those items as well related to other goals, um, as well as Ms. Page, who uh, many of you know Ms. Page has been part of Indian Brook. How many years? Since it began. <laughs> Since the beginning. And Indian Brook turns 40 this year, so. There you go. So. We are very happy to have her with us still, let me tell you. you. Um, our next goal update is around communication. Um, and actually, you'll, it's hard to see, but that's actually um, a snapshot of both our website, which um, shows uh, the number of teachers that are utilizing um, individual web pages to communicate with parents um, all the time. And next to it, I told Mrs. Canducci, I know she was going to be in the limelight, so. But that's Mrs. Canducci's web page, and I kind of, um, it, again, it's very hard to see, I apologize, but um, I uh, showed one tab which just shows the various components and the amount of work uh, she puts into that web page to communicate parent with parents on a daily basis, the updating and so forth. And that's just, you know, one uh, piece uh, of the communication. Um, um, I, I told her I wasn't going to, but I mean, one of the things we talked about prior to is there's another program our teachers are using um, extensively, well beyond the number of teachers that are, that are noticed on that website. It's called Class Dojo. And it is, pro I, I hear, see a lot of people shaking their head that you're familiar with. It. It's a phenomenal program because it's instantaneous. The teachers can literally, just using a tablet, um, a Chromebook, or what have you, communicate to the parents as to how their ch children are doing within the classroom. And they each have their separate account, their own login. It has just been a, a phenomenal um, program to have at the disposal because it's immediate. You know, you think of something you want to share it with a parent, you have that capability. A lot easier than, you know, oh, geez, at the end of, you know, the lesson on, you know, that I'm doing an hour from now, I'm going to remember to go over and, and make sure I uh, communicate out with that parent. So um, these are just some of the tools and the communication pieces that um, they're using on a daily basis. And it, it really uh, speaks volumes to the amount of effort they put on a daily basis. Um, um, our, our next goal was, was around looking at... Um, uh, PBIS, a uh, positive behavioral intervention system, and how we create a community in our school um, that are all intertwined, that, that are all connected, that the, the children um, are empowered as to their own um, behaviors on a daily basis. And you see, I, that's the one thing you can see, that, that term in quotes, expected behavior. And social thinking, the, the whole thing around it is about expected behavior. It's not looking at, you know, calling out Johnny when he doesn't do something right, it's calling out Johnny when he does something right. And it's on a continual basis. We have blue tickets, we have assemblies, we do pizza parties for the kids. We, it's just an entire community um, event um, that takes place throughout the year. Uh, we have different themes. And I think one of the greatest accomplishments that's happening now is between the number of students who are connected to EdTV, 
the amount of taping that's going on. So kids will do segments. We did a segment last year with the buses, and the kids literally, we had a bus come up, and they did a whole thing about appropriate behavior on the bus versus inappropriate behavior on the bus, expected behavior. And it was great. The kids filmed it. The kids acted it, and then we showed it to the entire um, school population. Um, so this has been a, a, an enormous success within the building. We've seen such improved behaviors, cafeteria, recess area, uh, buses. It's so nice not to get those bus complaints from, from the drivers on a daily basis. So it, and again, it had nothing to do with looking at someone doing something wrong. It was exposing what they've done correct on a daily basis, that expected behavior. So it's really um, been a, a positive thing for the entire school. Um, and again, I apologize, it's going to be hard to see, but um, I even, <laughs> with my glasses, I'm having trouble seeing it from this distance, but these are some of the community highlights that we, we have been able to accomplish over the course of the last two years um, that are all connected to both the curriculum, the community, how do we intertwine all those things that are, you know, that, that are occurring, both in school, outside of school. And, uh, you know, the science night, the literacy night's been a great um, um, yearly event. Um, the um, readathon, which I, uh, I mean, I, I was going to show, but unfortunately, I think the size would be so small it'd be difficult. But um, of course, our uh, readathon this year with our Harry Potter Day um, was such an enormous success um, and such a surprise to the kids. I'm starting to feel like Dr. Maestas because how do we top that next year? Yeah. I know he has to do it on a yearly <laughs> basis. Now we're already saying how do we top that? Um, but it's just to bring that community together. The kids did a phenomenal job. We wanted to reward them, and they were just so excited by it all. And again, these are the things that we're doing um, to reach out to both our school community as well as our um, parent community. So um, see, these are some of the other uh, events that, that, again, it's hard to see. Of course, you, you were all part of the, uh, came to our, uh, um, yeah, the Wizards, yep. Uh, oh, you can see it, thank you. I, <laughs> maybe I should come over your shoulder. Um, our post, uh, we did the uh, pasta night last spring where the teachers are the servers and the kids love it because, you know, it just brings that community. Um, we have started this year. Um, we go about every other month or so. We're going to Laurel Woods where we've been bringing kids to sing to the uh, elderly there as well as we brought the band, uh, the instrumental program to them. So, again, it's just reaching out to the community um, and doing some of those things and, of course, our cleanup day. But... Um, you know, there's just so much constantly going on, and not just our school, but in all the schools throughout um, Plymouth. Um, so I just wanted to highlight some of those. And of course, as you know, we were able to take a tour and you were able to see the entire playground and everything that we've accomplished out back there. Um, and again, it's really coming together. It's nice to have that one safe area where all the kids can go out um, daily. And it's not just for um, recess after lunch. Um, I, I heard Dr. Sorensen talking about the, the importance of physical activity. And our, our teachers are trying to fit in additional time to take the kids out to release some of those energies and so forth. So, I mean, again, it's just a quick highlight of some of those um, uh, things that we've accomplished, and it's just a, a small sampling of what our teachers uh, do both on a daily basis and the school does uh, as well. So, um, so moving forward... Um, I kind of piggyback these two. Our next improvement plan, I mean, goals one and two are very much like they were in the past. I mean, our primary focus is academics and making sure our children are successful. It was so important listening to um, the gentleman from Cape Auto talking about how important it is that these children can read and write and do those things so successfully because of the skill level. So it's always going to be our primary focus. Um, but we are taking a look at the differentiation and kind of looking at a couple of different things related to that that's more important because what we are noticing is the, school, the student population has changed. Um, students we all know are coming in with a, um, trauma. Some are coming in with just uh, situations at home that might not uh, be how um, we were, uh, um, our home environments were when we were children and so forth. So. Um, Ms. McKenzie, she is one of our special ed teachers, and um, she's instrumental in what we're looking at moving forward to differentiation around ELA and mathematics. So I'm going to pass the mic to her. Sure, yeah, that's fine. It's not really coming any. We got it, we got it. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Uh, so our inclusion model works 
there is a moderate special needs teacher that works in between two classrooms, and those classrooms are intertwined with a door. Um, in the model that we have been doing, uh, my co-teachers and myself, we pre-test and we post-test every unit um, for reading, writing, and math. So we gather ability-based groups um, based on the pre-test, and then we cater the academic differentiation based on those ability-based groups. And the, the good thing about that is that it changes every unit because um, especially with the spiraling units in math and all of the different reading and writing units that we have, um, each unit is so different. And you might have a child that's really great at some geometry aspects, but maybe not, uh, doesn't have as much background knowledge in fractions. So um, those lower level kids don't get stuck in the same ability-based group. Um, and then also it's great because we get to see the difference between the pretest and the post-test, how much growth they've made. Um, did you want me to talk about? Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought I was doing goal four. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> um, As we move forward with the differentiation, um, she can really talk about a successful model. She's doing it. But now what we're looking at is, for example, we're having children in traditional classrooms with no support with a lot of behaviors that it's very difficult um, for them to have the same success in that differentiation model. So how do we change and support that differentiation, apply some of those concepts? So um, we're looking at, looking at how we support those teachers and those students particularly in having success. Um, for example, you know, we have children that literally, they need to take a walk every 15, 20 minutes because they need to release energy. Um, we're creating those room to breathe spaces where a child can go off and, but it's, it's difficult. Teachers have to, you know, learn to accept this. It's different teaching, you know, to see a child just get up and walk over to a, a space while you're talking. Um, so that's what we're going to be working on, the differentiation. How do we support those children that are having difficulty in that environment, in that daily environment? And um, what Ms. McKenzie has done in the environment, she works in the third grade inclusion team. She's had a lot of success with that, working with those students. Um, and she's, as I said, worked with many of those types of students. But now we need to expand it out. So, um, you know. As I said, she's had a great deal of success, and we're hoping that we can expand that out and differentiate all of the um, students that are in need of that type of support. So, um, so we'll be looking at that for both ELA and mathematics and the data collection around that. So we'll be looking at more of the subgroups and how we support those subgroups and how they grow um, accordingly over the course of the next couple of years. Um, one of the things that I do want to mention, and everybody's aware of, of course, our target data keeps changing because the test keeps changing. <laughs> so I know, <laughs> seems like you know every couple of years we're talking about a changing test, and everybody knows now we're switching um, back to the MCAS now 2.0. Uh, so we'll have to start looking at some baseline data and see how that plays out moving forward with um, both ELA and mathematics. So, um, our Jeez, I'm, I really. Um, our third goal is is um, taking a look at. Um, I'm sorry. Our third goal. I got to go to the next right. Yes, is looking at science. Um, Mrs. Canducci, I don't know how many years. Mrs. Canducci is phenomenal. She's been part of my school council for. Yeah. I, I know um, she could probably retire from school council. She's been on it for so long. She's a phenomenal resource. Um, uh, and one of the things that I, I love about her too is she loves science and technology, which really plays into the trends uh, in education today. So um, we decided to add this goal because I will say our data has not been as great in science and we need to start taking, making sure we take a look at it more um, in depth um, as we move forward. So if I may. I've gotten out of this in so many years here. All right. <laughs> we are going to have um, a new goal in science this year. Um, as many of you know, we, as uh, the Plymouth Public Schools, are now using the NGSS, or Next Generation Science Standards, for our, um, the things that we teach. 
And um, next year we're going to be using our embedded PD where the sub substitutes will come in and classroom teachers can gather together to work on some things. And this year our, our goal is going to be to get to science. So we're going to have um, some opportunities to pool all our resources together, to gather some more resources and activities so that we can differentiate our science curriculum so that we can um, reach all levels of all the children. And we're also gonna have some opportunities to get all the tools and activities into common places so that everybody can access the materials easily because honestly, that takes a lot of time. And um, this year, MCAS will not, be te will not be assessing the next generation science standards. They'll be doing the old standards. But um, in the 2018 school year, that's gonna be our baseline data. So we'll be able to see how we do as of our <coughs> next year's <coughs> test. Yeah. Anyone want to say something? I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. Or do you want to switch the switch slide for them? Uh, so I know Dan touched upon it a little bit, but um, our new goal as we've moved forward with the positive behavior oral incentive program, um, and that has really reached school wide, and it's done a really nice job of um, being able to target everyone and making everyone. Um, have more positive or expected behavior. Um, but we're moving the ASD, we have the transition of the ASD program coming over. Um, so we're really looking to increase awareness for all staff members um, to be able to support those emotional needs. Um, and some things that we're doing for that, we, we did the test run of the um, Room to Breathe program and that worked really well. It's just a calm space within the classroom. I know I think you guys saw it. Um, where a child can go over at any time. You, there's some boundaries, obviously, that you need to establish with it. But um, a child can go over at any time and feel safe and still be able to access the curriculum um, while, while being able to sort of self-regulate their behaviors. Um, and what? <laughs> Yeah, the thing is, you, you really can't access any academics with them until you target the behavior and you establish the relationship with them. Um, so I think, especially working around the mind frames of teachers as well, that those behaviors and things and those aggressive behaviors sort of need to be targeted first before you can access those academics. It's really about building rapport, mm -hmm. maintaining safe, safe spaces, differentiating your own thought process on what you think of as education. I think, I think that'll work. All right, my goal is goal five, and it has to do with the upcoming 2020 celebration. So each grade level is in the process of developing a variety of opportunities for the children and the teachers themselves to establish and develop a partnership with the children and staff of the Riverside Primary School in Plymouth, England. Now, I chose to explain what the kindergarten intends to do because I was a kindergarten teacher. So the kindergarten teachers intend to create with the children a series of flat Stanley videos and picture diaries that will first introduce themselves, their school, and their town to the kindergarten of the Riverside School. Flat Stanley will then take a trip to England and hopefully the children and staff at the Riverside School will do the same and share their school in town with the Indian Brook Kindergarten. And the hope is that this activity will be the beginning of an ongoing correspondence throughout the year and succeeding years between the two schools. So the other teachers too are also in the process of developing activities, but I chose the kindergarten for a special reason. Have you guys any particular reason? I know. Yes. So I know that's a quick um, overview of each of the goals. Um, some are still in development, as uh, Ms. Page talked about, because we have uh, different grade levels looking at different ideas that they might want mm -hmm. to uh, support. Uh, we also might be expanding beyond uh, one school because um, I um, met with um, Mrs. Babini, the social studies coordinator, and uh, she uh, shared with us that there's another school, uh, Mayflower, 
that is interest as well. So um, we're looking at, um, as I said, developing some partnerships. And I've been in touch with one of the schools via email. We've been going back and forth and trying to figure out. It's a little hard over there. They actually have multiple administrators. So it's, it's interesting. Who does what? I know. Um, in the build, one building, there's three different administrators, and that's their title. They have like titles. So it's a little interesting, the dynamics. But we hope over the course of the next several years that we develop some um, partnerships at all different grade levels. Uh, we'd like to do some live Skyping and so forth where they might see some presentations. Our third grade curriculum is all about Massachusetts, so we thought that would be a great one that they could actually film themselves getting our ed TV involved, which they've done in the past, and you know, filming it and so forth, and then sharing them out with um, the schools over in England and so forth. So again, um, we're really excited about some of this. It incorporates a lot of the te technology pieces. Um, we're, we're really looking at the, the needs of our students throughout this plan, and we're, we're hoping that it will continue to you know, excel our s students forward and ultimately, of course, um, give them the skills so they can be successful academically and mm -hmm. in life moving forward. So, any questions? I apologize. I try to do it as. Any questions <laughs> or comments? Yeah, Mr. Morgan. No, I just want to thank you for the tour today, and I really appreciate what you're trying to do with the outside space. And congratulations on the playground. Thank you. And um, you know, it's just it's, it's come along nicely. I know you worked very hard to make the whole school an inviting place to learn and a safe place to learn. So thank you. Ms. Badger? I know I already asked you this question um, earlier, but just because we have such a high sure. number of viewers out there, mm -hmm. um, I, I figure we, I do get the question all the time about the, from different parents about the, the planks or whatever the that were ordered. Yep. That, well, that, that, yeah. Um, explain how they're going to be that, dealt with. As you know, I did say it's kind of fallen into my lap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> um, we have purchased the treks. Uh, we've, or, uh, I'll be basically the one. Yes, constructing them. I've done a lot of construction around here, people know, so <laughs> it's not the first time I've taken on a, a task such as this. But yeah, we'll be doing it over the next probably year to 18 months and it'll be all done. We are doing, as I mentioned to you, transforming it somewhat because the initial um, proposal was to create some kind of a boardwalk, which you clearly see we have asphalt sidewalks that go right up to the playground. So we, everything is already um, handicap accessible uh, to our entire field area. So what we've opted to do instead is we're looking at building benches and so forth that will be uh, distributed uh, around um, the playground area, the classroom and so forth, outdoor classroom and so forth that will recognize all those donors. Thank you. You're welcome. Very good. Anybody else? Well, it, this was an excellent presentation and the tour was really enjoyable also. I need to make sure we uh, talk to Mr. Montron and everybody and just give a shout out to the custodial staff too mm -hmm. because yes. the building Phenomenal. is literally yep. shining. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. every, every room was very well maintained, so thank great you. job. I will express that to them. Spread the word over I will them. definitely do so. And I do want to thank everyone up here. There are two party members that are not here today. Um, uh, Ms. Carrie uh, Jitsi, she is a parent. She actually, what a background she has. She works for UL in the education department. So she was one of the ones who was very instrumental in the startup of our science nights that we hold. Uh, Mrs. Curtin was here. In fact, I pointed out to many of you that she was at a fifth grade meeting and uh, I saw her and then she came back up the ramp, but Mrs. Curtin was here tonight. Um, um, we do have two new members moving forward. Um, we actually have our PTA president who is gonna come on board. Um, Michelle Braz, as well as one of our third grade teachers, Miss Webb. So we are expanding again, which is great. So Very good. Exactly. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, our next program update is from our curriculum coordinators. We have them all here tonight. Yes. Dr. Maestas? Yes, tonight we have our four academic Before curriculum coordinators here are... to address the school committee. And I'm, uh, you're familiar with all of them except for Kelly, and I'll, I'll just introduce everybody. And then uh, to, my, to my right, you have, first up on the right, we have Allison Reardon. She is our um, coordinator for science and engineering. Dr. Lisa White, she's uh, English language arts and also does library media, which we actually put on her plate a couple of years ago. And uh, <laughs> she's done a phenomenal job with that. Um, and then we have uh, Dr. Kathleen Beanie, who is on the far left, and she 
um, has been with us for uh, a number of years. And then we also have our newest coordinator, who I don't think that you have had an opportunity to no. meet. So uh, Kelly, Dr. Kelly Batinas. Uh, Kelly actually started out um, her career here in Plymouth, and she uh, taught for us in, in the math department at Plymouth South High School. And then she left the district to become an assistant principal and then did some other curriculum stuff in, in, in her former district along with that. And then she became uh, the selected candidate. How long have you been with us now, Kelly? Um, some months. <laughs> Handfuls of months with a little break in service for um, uh, having a baby. Yeah, maternity. <laughs> so, it's been a busy year. <laughs> and uh, Kelly has been a, a welcome addition to uh, the district. And I'll turn it over to the coordinators, and they can present their, uh, present their update. Yes, math. Sorry. Hi, everybody. Hey. Good evening. Uh, so I want to just kind of put a little context to what we did. Um, I'm not going to apologize. You can't see it. You have it in front of you. That's right. <laughs> uh, if you want to follow along up there, you can. Uh, Gary already introduced us, but I also want to recognize our uh, academic coordinator secretaries in our office, Cindy Toomey and Jenny Nolan, who do a great job at making us look good in the district and, and, and helping us along and doing what we do. So um, they're invaluable to what we do. Um, they are, oftentimes we are not in the district. We could go a week at a time and not be in the district or in our office and they just make sure they know where we are as they can attest to. They know where we are at all times. They can reach out to us. So they do a great job and we are, we are very thankful for them. Um, our context for this presentation, rather than give you individual program updates in terms of our different subject areas, we wanted to give you kind of an overall, uh, an overarching program as to what we all do and highlight within that um, some of the good things that we have been doing. And so you'll see we'll each speak to different areas in general and we'll highlight things and, and maybe jump in at different times uh, based upon what we've been doing. So the first thing is, and can you advance that for us please? Uh, the first thing is to um, just kind of review what our job goal is. And this comes directly from our job description, um, which is on the school committee policy. And you can see here that basically by reading this, we, I like to say we bring consistency. Somebody asked me, well, what exactly do you do? And I said, well, my job is to bring consistency in all grades dealing with science. And everyone here for their individual areas does that exact same thing. And and you go to districts, you know, we're one of the things that we'll speak to in a little bit is how active we are outside of Plymouth as well. And in doing that, one of the things that I think we see more often than not and that you may not see or that our staff may not see or our parents may not see is that the districts that don't have a K through 12 coordinator really truly at times sometimes feel out of sorts. That's what they share with us. They might have a K-5, they might have a 912, they might not have a middle school, they might have a K-8, they might, it, it, every configuration is, is somewhat different, but to have that K-12 consistency is, is really truly um, a, a significant piece to what I think our success is in our, in our respective areas. So I think that when you look at this job description, it, it really kind of speaks to that um, and what exactly we do. And, and we do a whole lot of things. Uh, one of the first things, if you could advance that, um, is curriculum development. And, and as curriculum coordinators, right, this, is, this makes complete sense, curriculum development. Um, and like I said, we do a whole lot. This is, if, if I could write the perfect job description, this would be my job description. This is why I chose the position that I chose and probably why we all did and, and didn't go down the road of, of a principalship, although Kelly tested the waters there a little bit. We, um, you know, we love curriculum. We, we are passionate about our areas. We are experts in our areas. And that's how we want to be utilized by the people in our district, whether it's a student, a staff member, an administrator, a colleague. You know, we want to be utilized in that fashion. And when it comes to curriculum, again, to bring that consistency, our job is to really translate what all of the mandates are from a federal, a state level, 
and what our South Shore groups are doing, what our state organizations are doing, our national organizations are doing, and really translate that and turn that into something that's meaningful uh, for the students in our district. And so whether that is, you know, developing a lesson plan for a struggling teacher and helping walk through that with them, developing a new unit, developing, you know, a unit test that goes with that, it, it, can, it can really vary as to what curriculum development is for us. Um, we, we pride ourselves on the fact that we give autonomy to our teachers. And I think that that's something, you know, we don't stand in front of our teachers and say, here are the lesson plans for the 180 days that you have in front of you. And that's not curriculum development. Curriculum development, again, is, is making sure that those mandates are in place and that we understand and translate for folks what they have to do so that they can make individual decisions and deliver content in a way that is personable to themselves as well as their students. And that's really truly what makes a, a successful teacher is you can have a biology teacher, you can have five different teachers teaching biology, and what makes them unique is that, that little bit of unique delivery of, of however they decide to do that instruction. And so as long as that consistency is there, they meet those common points, you know, we encourage that. So, we just highlighted for you a little bit. We obviously align it to, to national and state learning standards based upon whether it's Common Core or frameworks. Um, we The, the storyline, the consistent storyline, as we said, um, grade level curriculum, depending upon what's new, what's different. Um, and then the instructional material piece, you know, we, we, the commercial aspect, going out and seeking items, you know, we don't just buy a box of things and deliver it to a teacher. A lot of it is coordinator developed um, and in our interpretation of things as well. So I am going to pass it off. Thank you. And, and to kind of piggyback on what Allison was talking about, one of the things we were at a meeting last week and I walked out and said to my colleagues, if anything represents what we do, it was today because we spent the first hour talking about midterm uh, scheduling at the high school and AP exams, and the second hour we spoke about kindergarten specialists. So we we see that vertical alignment. We know what's going on at the different levels, and and um, are happy to have a hand in all of those parts. Um, one of the other big pieces we do is the instructional strategies piece, and each one of us in areas you can see them highlighted on your um, list are kind of things we all focus on, and that speaks to what Allison was saying is that. We want, like, for instance, in my department, you know, we're looking at questioning and historical thinking and sourcing of information. We also support the literacy program and, and work hand in hand. And I think, again, one of the strengths of this um, office is that we are all together and that we all work hand in hand. And I, I'm working on this, something, it's something new, I run it by Lisa. You know, how does this fit into what you are doing? So that the teachers don't see it as fragmented. They have all these different strategies. So whether it's the science and engineering looking at claims and evidence or the social studies looking at sourcing or the media literacy people looking at the, the um, media piece. The um, in English to the PV legs. Um, Lisa, do you want to explain what, what that means and then I'll follow up with Sure, that's just one example of something that we've um, we've had an opportunity to bring in a, a speaker and an expert on speaking and listening skills. I've mentioned him before, and we've been able to bring him to elementary, middle, and high school staff and talk about how do we develop effective speakers. And so PV Legs has become, um, you've, you've heard a lot about it, I think, in the district, especially this year. And what's really nice is um, we see it in action more and more. Um, there was a, a student who spoke at the PCIS um, faculty meeting the other day that presented a speech that she had written for her English class. Um, Kathy commented that at the geography yeah. fair, um, some of the judges were commenting on how well spoken our students were and how well they presented. Science fair, clearly that's something that, you know, is part of their presentation. So I think it's those kinds of things where um, we can say, how does this fit, you know, with all of the things that we're doing and support that in all of our content areas. So I think that's that's the biggest piece. Not only are we looking at those strategies and the different, the best practices within each of our content areas, um, bringing them to our teachers, whether it's through embedded practice or it's through working with um, 
with each other, we're looking at, at during in-services with different grade levels and being able to show those teachers, you know, here's the best research-based um, activities that are out there and how they can work with our students and support all learners at all levels and have kids also see that common language coming up through the system. And then personnel? That's me. That's you. So speaking of personnel, here I am, the new one. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I do. I do want to take a minute to thank you for you know welcoming me back to the district. Um, there's f a level of familiarity, but but not too much. Um, when I left in the fall of '09 to go to my other district for a while, um, a lot of transition was happening at Central Office at, at Plymouth South, and I kind of always kept looking back over my shoulder, like, oh wait, wait, wait what am I missing? You know, um, I loved where I was. I loved what I was doing, but um, there was always a piece of me in Plymouth. I always had to think if it was an unhealthy connection like okay Kelly just move on like it's okay um, but you know this is where I was meant to be and, and it's like a second family and my husband sees it in me and I I feel it and and to gain another layer of my family at, at central office has been great so thank you and and with that being said that's why I have personnel and you won't see me talking too much today because they said Kelly what do you want to talk about I said nothing that's going to mess up anyone else's program <laughs> Because I'm still, I'm still learning the, the bits and pieces. But um, you know, we've been talking a lot about curriculum, um, but really, it's it's great to have a hand in those personnel choices as well. And and we really complete the cycle. Um, we interview. We then work with um, our coaches or other staff members or administrators to work on orientations and training for those new staff members, whether they're right out of college, switching over from industry. Um, you know, we we have a hand in that. Uh, we help evaluate throughout the year at the middle and high school level, and then um, recently been working with our, our um, administrators for scheduling buildings and staffing meetings as well. So it's, it's great to have a voice in those conversations um, to lend our subject area expertise you know, to those really important decisions that impact our students. So one of the things that we all always want to do is see how our students are performing. Um, we develop curriculum, we teach teachers and, and support them with instructional strategies, and then we want to see, um, in terms of the assessment piece, how is that working? Um, what are, where are the areas that we're doing very well? What are the areas that we need a little bit more, um, to, whether it's professional development or whether we need to um, bring in some additional resources for students or teachers. So assessment is a large part of what we do. Um, that can be everything from uh, finding commercial assessments to developing our own internal district assessments. Um, we have really a balance in the district. I would say we, we, um, we really try to make them our own if at all possible. Um, at the elementary level, we have a number of reading and math assessments that um, are benchmark diagnostic assessments that we really want to get a handle on where our students are as early as possible so that we can provide the type of support that they need. So those assessments are critical for helping us to, to do that and for helping teachers to see the patterns um, of strengths and, and weaknesses of where their students are. And at the middle and high school level, we've developed a number of common assessments where all of the teachers at a grade level or in a department might give an assessment uh, twice a year or three times a year where we then sit as a department and analyze that work. Um, so for example, they all respond to a certain prompt or, or something that they've read. And then we look and we say, what are we finding? What are the patterns we're seeing? And how does that impact our instruction? So that assessment piece is not just the state testing, although clearly that's an aspect of what we look at, but it's also that local um, assessment that we do that's very based in our day-to-day -day practice. Uh, and then along with that, we have a, a critical role in the analysis of that data. So we are constantly looking at our data uh, and, and, and sort of doing our own analysis, but we work very closely with building principals and assistant principals, with coaches, with department heads, um, really across buildings, across um, subject areas, really to look holistically at what are we noticing in terms of patterns. So again, that development and uh, Analysis of data is a really important part of our of our job, and that leads us to student supports. <laughs> um, so we work closely with the special education department, and um, also in developing our RTI 
model, um, really trying to look at what are the academic supports that we need, that our students need. Um, so one example I've you know, talked a lot about is the reading recovery. You know, that's one example of targeting first graders who might, might be struggling in reading. Um, we put a number of those supports in place um, at all levels. Um, particularly, you know, again, we, we try uh, to, to focus a lot on the elementary level because we know the earlier intervention, the better for that. Um, so we work with Stacy Rogers. We actually have a committee we've been working with uh, Kelly and I and, and Stacy and Chris on um, really just relooking at our RTA model and trying to see are we articulating that effectively? What else do we need to put in place in our buildings with that model? And um, and just making sure, you've heard a lot about differentiation, making sure that whatever it is that we have for curriculum and, and for materials, that they're meeting the needs of all of our students at, at every level, whether that's students who, who are struggling or also students who are excelling at that area. So those are two other pieces of the puzzle. Thank you. Um, and then professional development, another big piece of what our office does and, and uh, spends a lot of time at. And Allison had mentioned um, Cindy and Jenny at the beginning. Um, and again, they are right hands. They are the ones who make sure everybody's forms get in and everything. People get registered for conferences and all of that. But our professional development, um, a lot of it is in-house. A lot of it is embedded in, um, in what we do. And I'm going to pass the mic to Allison a bit so she can explain what she's been doing with embedded science this year. But we all have the opportunity to not only for us to go, go out and attend conferences and bring that back to teachers and then work with them in the district and in service and in department meetings and in um, summer workshops and all of that. But it's also an opportunity for us to get our teachers out, to send our teachers to things, make those matches where we find that there's a really good conference on service learning and you need to go to this or here's a really good conference on, on literacy that we're sending the teachers to reading conferences and, and kind of making those matches so they get to see the excitement of being part of a professional atmosphere and we call it feeding your teacher soul you know sometimes you just need to go to your content area get some of that um, rich learning and bringing it back into the district and doing a piece of it and a lot of it is done here um, not only work um, is very close with Dr. Campbell in setting up those opportunities for teachers, not only for bringing courses, um, but setting up the professional development workshops for our teachers to be able to be part of that. Um, I remember being actually interviewed for this job, and, and Mr. Uh, Dr. Uh, no, um, Dick Silver asking me, what's the biggest thing you need to do? And I said, we're cheerleaders for our departments. We are the ones that go out and get our teachers and, and give them the opportunities, because they're doing their job all day in their classroom. We're the ones that are out there saying to them, you know, here's an opportunity for you. Here's, here's something I'm going to nominate you for. Here's something that you need to go and see, so that they get that professional. They don't have time to go to all of those meetings or all of those uh, being part of, of the organizations that we're able to do and bring back, and then bring back that professional development to them. And that's, I think, one of the biggest roles we have is that not only that vertical alignment and, and making kind of the consistency in the district, but also getting to the teachers and working with the principals to give those opportunities to teachers outside. But Allison, I think you've done that in better things. Um, I'm going to speak specifically to the job, the to the job embedded piece, and I know Lisa has always touched upon this, and I'm sure you know, given the opportunity, Kelly would as well. The embedded professional development model is by far the most effective. When you can provide them with professional development during the working day, and not at the end of the day, not on a Friday before vacation. There's, <laughs> when you can do it during the work day, it is, it is absolutely most effective. And and you know, just an example today. Um, I don't, I don't, I always joke, I don't have any cool coaches, you know, when it, when it comes to science, if there's a question, you know, I'm called upon, and, and whether that's a teacher or a principal, you know, they have that question, and so, you know, the sixth grade teachers at South Middle asked me to come to a meeting today, and I said, fine, so 9.15, I showed up on their off block, and they said, you know, here, we have, you know, when we, when you take field trips out, and you take this, and this, and this, when we finish this unit, we're going to have 19 days of instruction left, and I said, okay. And they said, so how, what do we do? And this is what we need to get through. And, and so what it ended up being is I taught science today. I taught science to five sixth grade teachers at South Middle for 60 minutes today. They needed to know about waves. They needed to know about 
the particulate model of matter. And so we sat there and, and we had a science lesson. And if they don't have that new content, which is coming from the new standards, and they're sixth grade teachers, and so that's an elementary certification, and they're not a science expert, that's what I do. So today it was science 101. Tomorrow it will be, you know, potentially how to use the science in the classroom, how to deliver that effectively. So it really depends on what we do, but being able to sit one-on-one or four-on-one or et cetera in that small embedded PD model is, is the most valuable thing there is. And it's something that we all clamor for time you know, with principles on, on how we can do that and can we get sub coverage and, you know, how can we manage that because we know that, you know, here's something that works and, and if it does work and, you know, a couple, probably about a month ago, I, I visited a classroom and the teacher just wanted me to model a lesson and we all do that. And so go into the classroom with a group of students that you've never met before. You've, you know, said hi in the hallway and you go in and, and you do a lesson and, and you show the teacher, you know, what is effective when it comes to this piece of content. Again, you know, I've said it before and, and just like everyone here, I'm a biologist by trade. Like that's what I know. But, you know, on this particular day, like today, I taught physical science. You, you do your best. And so I went in and modeled that. And I and telling the teachers that, you know, you're doing this for the first time, too. And, and you're going you're gonna to struggle with it. You're going to. But they look for you to be that expert. And so it, it's truly um, it's something that we, we do really value in, in our jobs is that opportunity to do that. And tomorrow morning, I'll be in fourth grade um, at 9.20 doing <laughs> Native American gigs. Again, we, teachers are very willing to open their classrooms to us. I'm doing fourth grade in service um, later on in the month on Native Americans. I was developing new stuff. Stuff works great in my office. I need to make sure it's working with actual fourth graders. So to be able to contact a fourth grade teacher who opens her doors, lets you come in, and I'm going back to play with kids I played with two months ago, and we're going to do some more stuff, um, is a wonderful thing. It's, it's sort of like being a grandmother. You can play and give them back, so it's great. Um, <laughs> sorry, Kelly. Yes, well, he's with his grandmother. He's fine. <laughs> OK. Um, another big part of what we do is the instructional resources. It's, um, and it's not just buying a textbook. It's looking at what resources are out there. We set, we work um, and do our budgets. Um, so we have input in the, the elementary budgets as well as in the secondary budgets. For the secondary budgets, we're the ones that work with the teachers on what resources they need um, to, for their programs. Um, Allison just orders all sorts of interesting things. I get some really good books. Um, and we, we're able to not only get them um, and disperse them out to teachers, but look at it and work with panels of teachers to look at the different resources that are out there. Here's something new. Um, is this whether it's a new textbook or a new novel that we want to um, put into the system, if it's a new um, activity of looking at technology, working with Julia Colby on what works effectively and what does she see as the, um, the best thing that we should be able to promote within our department. Um, and then not only just get it, but then do the professional development around it. It's not just walking and handing the program. It's what Allison's doing with different. It's going into the classrooms and working with teachers and be able to sh show them the different resources and how they can work. And again, that ensures that, that consistency piece across the district. It isn't one building gets something and another one doesn't. We really, our job is, is kind of the you know, resource police. We want to make sure everybody, if something's really good for one building, it's really good for all buildings. And we want to make sure that the, all kids and all students and teachers have that opportunity to look at all the different materials that they're um, that they're using oh, and you're doing yes. celebration. Um, so another great piece uh, of our role here and I think we can all agree you know the building administrators this is when you see the culmination of your your work with the student celebrations um, these range all grade levels um, our students put out a variety of publications they are working on you know competitions at, um, math team um, different science competitions. We have fairs and rallies with our students representing all the subject matter. And, um, you know, coming up now is award season. So senior class awards, underclass awards, you know, those academic excellence awards. Um, you know, it's, it, again, it's just a really, we're all teachers by trade and it's, it's nice to work with the buildings and, and see the fruits of our labor and, um, and have all those celebrations take place. And I think, you know, as students change, those celebrations will change as well. The different ways that we have our students display their work and share their thoughts and ideas, I think are, 
are going to constantly be changing, and it'll be nice to have you know the new Plymouth South opening next year, and 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 really have them showcase all the new things that they'll be able to do. It'll be exciting to see. Uh, so as I, I mentioned at the at the beginning, you know we we get out we get out every so often um, out of Plymouth, and we also you know in getting out of Plymouth and the connections that we make, um, like I said, we we see what others are doing, and and they see what we're doing, and you know the first bullet here, you know, Lisa was asked by by surrounding districts to come and visit. Um, Plymouth to see the literacy model firsthand and to walk around and, and to see what people were actually doing and what they could take back to their own districts and model. And that obviously speaks volumes to, to what we do. And again, it comes to the value of our position in the district. And, and again, not all districts obviously value that. And to think, and I, and I kind of chuckle with some of my colleagues around the area, like to think that, and no offense to Dr. Campbell, but to think that Dr. <laughs> Campbell could become the expert in science the way I am, and ELA, you know, ELA, and math, <laughs> and, and history, it, it, I could not imagine the scope of that position, including the foreign language, and the PE, and the SPED, like, I just, the, the scope of that just scares me. To, to think of that, that that some just one person would have to kind of handle that. Um, so again, it, it's it's a nice thing to have. Um, you can see, you know, some of the bullets that we chose to share. You know, the journalism program, and and really kind of making that a model for other schools to follow. Um, getting the opportunity myself to participate, um, to be asked by the Department of Ed, uh, as I was to present at this year's STEM Summit alongside of them. Um, we got to share, there were two districts that they asked to have their story shared, and it was the Boston Public Schools and the Plymouth Public Schools. And that's a, that's a pretty big deal, um, to, to be you know able to, to share out what we're doing at the annual convening as well. And Kathy's participation um, with the National Geographic program and being able to nominate local teachers to participate in such a nationally recognized um, program is is a huge accomplishment you know for the things that we do so um, it is it is nice to like I said to kind of to see to get out to see what others are doing to bring back and and be selective at, at what we bring back and 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 what's best for Plymouth so <laughs> <laughs> All right. And the community connections. And I think a lot of this um, is old news to you because you have been invited to many of these different activities or see them in the paper or on in the Voyager of the different things that are going on. Um, the connection with the public library, not only our summer reading program, but having them come in and work with Lisa's group and, and offering professional development in some of those areas. On um, the Credit for Life program, the very successful program that you saw last week um, or a couple weeks ago um, taking place. Um, in social studies, we've been very connected with the Adopt an Artifact program that has gone on for a number of years at Pilgrim Hall. Um, the Civics Bee uh, just came, it was the third annual Civics Bee that, that um, just took place a few weeks ago. The Selectman's meeting, uh, just getting every, getting kids and getting them the opportunities to go out and be part of it. Um, the Class of 2020 projects to which Ms. Page has, they're now ninth graders and since first grade, she and Judy Foster have come into the office every summer and file their program. So they each have a portfolio of activities they've done since grade one. They're finishing their ninth grade program, uh, project, uh, which will be filed. And again, Mrs. Toomey, my secretary, and I go up to the attic at Central, and we carefully down all the boxes. And Sue and Judy come in, and they file, and we carry them all back up to the office. So um, those are kind of the ongoing um, connections. And we get the calls in the office from local organizations and ask us, um, can we provide some students? Can some students take part in it? And you see a lot with the visual performing arts kids, but it's across the board all, all the number of different um, activities that we do. And one of the ones that it isn't really tied to one of our areas, but it is the, um, the back to school food drive that our teachers participate in every first day of school and bringing canned goods when they come to our opening meeting and it goes to the, the um, food pantry in Plymouth that is warehouse that distributes to all of the pantries. And that's a call that I got last summer when we weren't, 
we were kind of readjusting our schedule this year, so I hadn't called them, and they called us and said, are you still doing that? We're really in need. We said, absolutely, and we set up the time, and they come and pick it up. So those are the kind of behind-the-scenes things that sometimes aren't really out there, but um, all of us have our kids um, out there, um, all the local science organizations being you know, at the harbor and all of the stuff that Allison's um, teachers are, are um, part of. And we've really been using our community as our professional development. Sometimes this this year, I know science went out and visited, and my department has gone out and visited. And it, it's getting our teachers out into the community where their kids live and finding out more about that and being able to take advantage of the rich resources that Plymouth has um, that are willing to partner, like we saw earlier today, um, to, um, coming back in and being part of that. So it's great. Um, the, the Plymouth UK partnership, um, we've you've all been up to date on a lot of things that, that is going on there. So again, one of the things as Dan was speaking about earlier is the sister school um, connections that teachers are making. Um, the anthology, we've had two, three, yeah. two anthologies. Yep. <laughs> um, our kids with the, the kids in the UK writing a joint um, program. Um, the middle school videos that, that are there, Plymouth South Middle School last year. Um, the two eighth grade teachers and um, history teachers, they are connected. Kids did projects here. They worked with Evan um, McNair out there, and Evan helped put together a video, and we had our celebration a few weeks ago when they got to see the video that the kids in England did and bring it back. PCIS is currently in the process of doing one of those videos, um, as some of the elementaries are as well. So being able to connect um, those and having the, the Twitter discussions, we had our high school kids talking with kids in the UK about um, government last year. Um, so those are a lot of interesting discussions going across the board, the Twitter that's going on, and um, being able to connect electronically when we know we can't get everybody there. Allison, do you want to explain the science one? Hi. Um, I'm actually headed in the, on the June trip coming up, and so in preparation for that, um, finally making some connections with science and, and how do we go about doing that. One of the things that I've been working at with the Institute for Research in Schools um, and Steve Greenwood is a, a CERN program at school. If you don't know what CERN is, it's the big giant particle accelerator in Europe. And so they have done some school projects with that and they're willing, his institute is willing to actually loan us some equipment for six to eight weeks at a time. And I think that it's a, a good fit with our middle school curriculum. Um, and, and so that's something that moving forward we're gonna look at, um, looking at the, the 3D model of, of the Mayflower, looking at the replica ship, looking at the Mars Autonomous Rover. So there's a, a bunch of different projects getting to Plymouth University to look at the Marine Studies Program, which is in the top 2% in the world, and it's just an absolute, I'm really excited to be able to see that resource firsthand. And then, you know, in addition, trying to, um, just in researching them, finding out that, you know, they underwent a planetarium upgrade just about 10 years ago and what they use it for now for full dome video and the festivals that they participate in sharing that with with Dan Riley and and the Ed TV crew and how we can go about utilizing our new planetarium renovation at the same time with that and, and how do we kind of bring the two programs together so there's a lot of exciting things that um, we're talking about and getting started on and um, just gonna kind of you know make the partnership um, even better So a lot of what we've talked about tonight um, is this idea of being leaders in the field. And um, one of the things that, that we all do is belong to professional organizations in our field. And that is really something that um, keeps us updated on what's going on out there in the field. Um, and also you develop a lot of relationships with colleagues and you can share ideas. What are you doing? This is what we're doing. I think we're all probably part of listservs now and, and a question will go out of, you know, about something related. And what are you doing here? We're trying to figure this out. Um, so developing those relationships. I think another thing though is being very involved at the state level. Um, almost, you know, we're, we're all on different committees. Um, a number of us have been on um, MCAS development committees on, uh, uh, Allison's a science ambassador for the new science standards. Um, history is going through a revision of their framework. Um, that Kathy's involved with that. Um, I'm actually on a, a committee that's meeting uh, 
Wednesday to talk about updates to the uh, licensure for some of the programs, uh, reading specials program and English teacher programs. So I think that it's important to be connected. Um, it's important to know the people that you can call up and ask when a question uh, comes up. And I also think it helps out our teachers because they then, we then, as Kathy said, pass that information on to our teachers and they feel in the loop <laughs> as to what's going on, you know, outside of the district. And as, as Allison has mentioned, in places where that doesn't happen, it, it, there can be a, a disconnect with that. Um, and so a good example of that is, you know, the, the pathway we took around the state testing where, um, you know, we're doing our testing right now. A portion of that is required um, to be done through technology as far as the state is concerned. We're able to do all of our testing through technology because we've been doing it now for two or three years. So for our teachers, this isn't brand new. Um, those kinds of things, you know, when you, when you know what's coming, you can do a better job of um, helping and supporting those changes within, within the staff. So I think that's a really important part um, of the job is really being um, aware of what's going on out there in the, in the world. <laughs> and, and not just at a state level, but a, as, you know, on a national level as well. Um, you know, I've been on NAEP panels and, and looking at how Massachusetts you know, scores in relation to other states, for example, and we're at the right at the top, and maybe, you know, sometimes people don't know that, you know, what a, what a great reputation for education we have in our state. So having that perspective, I think, is really, really important. I'm back. Um, my colleagues were gracious enough to give me my own little math update slide. Um, because, it, you know, and I felt passionate about, about talking to you and spreading the word to the community because uh, Linda Coffey did retire last February. Um, so there was a, a lapse in time there where I was staying in the loop while in my other district um, after I was hired, just trying to, to keep up with things and, and, you know, then working this year. So um, I'm trying to bring as much consistency as possible. Um, but my biggest... I'm an onion peeler. I peel back the onion. Mm -hmm. And I, I've told other administrators, you know, please don't be frustrated with me if I answer your question with a question because I, I need to know what's going on. Um, and the biggest thing I think that's come out of it so far is, is a, a 6 through 12 philosophy for our students that all students have these opportunities to excel in our math program all the time. Um, high school and, and a little bit of middle school is my area of expertise. I did, I have to develop my immune system to elementary. I, I did read to at West and it was a wonderful experience and I was home with the stomach bug two days later. <laughs> so uh, I need to <laughs> develop a, a bit more of an immune system before I dive into to elementary school. But um, uh, one of the biggest frustrations I have is, is when I hear from students or, or parents that say, well, from sixth to seventh grade, if my student isn't placed in a certain spot, that's it. That's it. I know their path now until 12th grade, it's paved for them. And I, the, I do get hit with some single case scenarios, and those are from your parents that are advocating for their students or students advocating for themselves that, no, no, I, I can do this, I can take this non-traditional path. And I don't want that to be case by case. I want to provide and advertise these opportunities for students. Um, so some of the things that we're working on is looking at that, you know, debunking the myth of that honors CP track in the seventh grade and having that be your only entrance into an honors program. Um, looking at an, maybe an algebra plus um, for some of our students that were placed in college preparatory in the eighth grade but want to make the leap to honors in the high school and what can we supply them to be able to do that. Um, maybe doubling up on courses at the high school level, some summer courses that we can offer so students can get to our AP classes um, sophomore or junior year as opposed to senior year or not at all. Um, so just looking at different ways uh, that our students can do that, again, if they're not placed right away. I mean, parents that come to me, um, Mrs. Fry, maybe you can think about this. You know, you have that boy that was born in July, and you say, do I put him in kindergarten in the fifth grade? Because is he going to be mature enough to handle school in middle school? You know, parents should not have to be preoccupied with those thoughts. Um, I had a winter baby, so I get off a little easier. But, um, you know, I, I don't want our parents or our students preoccupied with those thoughts. There, there are ways to accelerate and be uh, an excellent honors level student if that's what you want to do um, anytime, not just 
one opportunity. Um, although we do, I do have to say we use multiple data points, local assessments like we've talked about, state assessments, um, teacher observation, student work. So I mean, I, I can say a lot of work is put into those sixth to seventh grade placements, um, but we could always do more. Uh, and that's what I hope to bring to this program. Um, I want to look at that eighth to ninth grade transition and make sure it's a smooth transition for our students, um, a consistent transition for our students that they're aware of all their opportunities. Um, another change um, is, is kind of re-looking at the program again and making sure we're doing what's, what's best. So when we started the everyday math curriculum, it was a K to six program. But then we put the math coaches in place after that, and they are K to five. Um, so what happened was at the middle school, we were running three different pr text programs, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, um, and our sixth grade teachers were using everyday math with no coach support, um, which I saw as a glaring difference when I got here. Um, the level of support our coaches provide is is amazing. I, I can't even speak enough to it. Um, so we'll be going to big ideas in the sixth grade, which is also what the seventh grade uses, which I think is going to provide a, a smoother transition for our students, a smoother setup for their eighth grade algebra curriculum. The companies agreed to do a free pilot next year for all sixth grade, all materials, all PD, um, completely free, which is wonderful. Um, We've been asked to host a PD session that maybe um, schools from other districts could come if they want to look at big ideas. And um, that will be a great opportunity for us to get some richer PD. If you are a hosting town, you get that free and it, you're listening to authors from the textbooks. Um, you know, just kind of a higher level of keynote speaker. So I'm excited to bring that as well. Uh, we'll be preparing for MCAS 2.0 at the high school. Um, if you're not aware, it, MCAS 2.0 only goes up through eighth grade this year because the state didn't feel that it would be fair for our sophomores to take such a high stakes test, never being exposed to it before. So um, in two years, so this year's eighth graders will then take it as their high stakes, you know, graduation requirement test as 10th graders. So we'll be pre preparing our high school teachers for that. And um, aside from all the supports we provide to students, um, our coaches have been looking at gifted and talented resources. I think it's much needed at the high school level. Um, again, I don't want our students to kind of hit that sixth, seventh grade mark where we're looking at honors and CP and say, wow, you know, what could we do for you more even at the elementary level? Um, Particularly, it seems to be hitting around fourth or fifth grade. I know some other schools, Hingham included, that's where they hit their gifted and talented student. That's where those math skills seems to, to really mature and shine. Um, so I do have my math coaches, Jen Powers and Jen Marcassiani, looking at um, particularly fourth grade and some richer activities that we could add for them, for those students that are really excelling in math. So just some things in the works, but I wanted to share. Thank you. If you have any questions for me or any of us, anybody have any questions? I'm really good at passing the microphone, so <laughs> whatever you need. <laughs> anybody have any questions or comments? I'm sorry, I'm looking all the way. Down. It's right here. Okay, <laughs> Ms. Badger. I just want to say that was great. Thank you for sharing all of that. But I did want to share two things that um, that I were one thing. I was talking to couple people about a few weeks ago and one of them happened to be a journalism teacher at another school district and he couldn't talk about more like how impressed he was about our journalism program and everything that is going on in Plymouth schools so I just want to make sure I pass that along um, and he was just really excited about that and then a personal thing that reading recovery video I know I've mentioned it here like four times <laughs> but I really enjoyed it <laughs> so. I, just to just to speak to that, because uh, I, I probably wasn't here when, when yeah. we were talking about it before, um, as much as I, you know, try to say, just skip ahead to the teachers and the kids. Um, <laughs> but that actually has been shared, I think, 550 times or something like that. And um, it was part of the uh, pass along to the representatives who were cutting the funding mm -hmm. um, campaign. And I'm happy to report that funding has been a, restored um, for a majority of that. PD program, so I'm not saying it was the video alone. <laughs> it was really good, though. But, but we'd like to take a little, yeah. you know, piece of that credit. I think it was just a really good way, like I was saying in math, we should do something like that, just to educate our parents and community members on, like, how that works, why we have these coaches and what their purpose is. You come and tell us, but, you know, there's nothing like a good video that someone can watch for right. a couple minutes. So. And, and also just to, give, just to give credit to our amazing yeah. um, 
video TV production uh, group because we couldn't make those high quality videos without them. And that was the other comment I received from a lot of people was they're just amazed that that was put together by a single school system <laughs> and not you know a professional company. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Dr. Sorensen. It was a great, it was a great presentation. You know, there, certainly there are hundreds of things we could say about how m much we value what you folks bring to the district. But let me, let me just close on, make two short ones. You know, we listen to all the school council presentations over the years, and we often hear the, a, a school council come to us and say, oh, you know, we're gonna adopt this program, we're gonna follow this book, or we're gonna, we're gonna some model, now we know where all that comes from. <laughs> I mean, that's really excellent, and, and most of the time. Right. And, and the other thing I wanna say is, is, is we brag about you. Mrs. Mrs. Burgess and I were uh, together at the, when we did the comprehensive review just a few weeks ago. And one of the things they asked us was, tell us something great about the school system. It was real easy to mention you guys. So thank, thank you very you. much. We that. <laughs> Anybody else? Great. Very good. Thank this you. is a very good format uh, that you put together. Great. I think it's a, a, it gives the public a chance to see much more of all the different things you do and how it crosses over and obviously crosses out to all the different schools. So, well done. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Okay. We have a, a request for a break. <laughs> I've gotten verbal and now I just got handed a written one. So I think they're, they're serious about it now. <laughs> <laughs> they put it in writing. I did, yes. Okay. <laughs> so it's nine o'clock. We'll take a five minute break. Okay. Thank you. Audit and end of year financial report. Now, Mr. Costin's not here tonight. Do you want to postpone it? Or? Okay. Dr. Maestas. Yeah. So every year we um, do a financial audit of, of, all our, of all our records, of all our. our uh, Financials, and this is something that we started probably eight years ago. And this report is pretty significant because it reviews last school year. So an auditor comes in, they sit at central office, and everybody's nervous, and he goes through all our records with the fine tooth comb. So if you take a look at the report, it is uh, the smallest report that we have ever received. And if you take a look at the um, letter, which is the, the first page, and this is a one-page report, typically they, they are not one page. If you go down to the, uh, right below the second paragraph, which is pretty significant for any public school system anywhere, and it indicates that there are no instances of non-compliance within the agreed upon procedures uh, were noted. So it basically, after they went through our entire financial structure, operations, uh, and systems that we put in place, they found absolutely no areas where we were in non-compliance with state or federal regulation, which is something that we really, we always worry about it. We know that we're doing things in, in you know, when, when we, we follow the rules. We one thing or something. Yeah, absolutely. It's been like the, uh, the uh, holding accounts and it, stuff it, sometimes it, yeah. and. It's, yeah, with uh, we've had um, areas with uh, vocational, with uh, accounts receivable, and how bills are paid. And I think it's a credit, and I know it's a credit to Gary Costin and his his office and his leadership to really go after our practice and procedure that really help us to be in compliance, to make sure that, because when you take a look at how we operate, Everything starts at our office and trickles down. And we get, we receive back the information that we really are trying to, uh, you know, ensure across the district. So what this report indicates is that the practices that we put in place and the process procedures we put in place, they're actually getting to people. And that information's coming back and it's working. So just wanted to share that with you tonight. Um, Gary is under the weather tonight, which is very rare. Um, and he really wanted to be here tonight, but I just wanted to uh, bring this up. Um, do, we, do we have the actual report? Um, we just have attached to our packets. We just have the letter. Yeah, I, I can see if we can get that. This is the all, is, 
that's all. That's the entire report, Mr. Begley. Is it? Is there a PDF version of it? Or? It's not the letter, right? That's that's the whole report. Oh, because last year, well, maybe because they had because findings had last findings. year. I gotcha. I gotcha. I gotcha. I gotcha. Gotcha. Well, well, to me, you know, Mr. Begley and Gary, Gary said you have to look at the report. So it was in my inbox. <laughs> so I pull it out and I'm looking through it, and I it was one piece, one piece of paper, and it was a pleasant surprise to see that all these things are are in compliance. So good, excellent. Right. And that that didn't make it in time to get into the state, uh, right? No, just missed it by a few uh, weeks. Yeah, the the state had a, a whole different set of questions that weren't really all that relative to to this, but because they yeah. did ask uh, in the subgroup we yeah. were in, they did ask us a lot of financial kind mm. of things and wanted to know how we were doing the accounts and stuff, the fundraising. Process. Well, we definitely have evidence to to demonstrate Perfect. that if something comes up in the report from the Department of Education that is not um, what we believe accurate, we have a document here that demonstrates that we're in compliance with, up. with that. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. That's it? Or That's it. That was it. <coughs> so now superintendent's goals. Yes, uh, it is that time again, and I know uh, Mr. Begley and I were uh, texting earlier tonight, and we <laughs> it's kind of hard to believe here we are again. Okay. Um, this will be my ninth evaluation with the, the committee, and um, just to give you an idea, the evaluation process changed uh, three years ago, which is very detailed, and that is the first document. So if you take a look at the agenda item tonight, the PDF document, which which is uh, the MASC Superintendent's Evaluation Guide for School Committees. The entire guide is there. It guides the process from start to finish. At the tail end of the guide, you will have the Superintendent's Evaluation document. That evaluation document is in Microsoft Word, so it's editable. So what we will begin uh, doing is, the, uh, is start collecting information for my evaluation. Keep in mind, the next school committee, I will present an update uh, to my goals. I provided an update earlier this year, so this will be the final update, and I will provide that information for you. I will also supply a document with uh, items that have uh, been completed this year or are in progress relative to the goals or other things in the district that um, I have been working on um, relative to the district and our strategic plan and, and, and how they how they may or may not tie in with, with, with my goals. Uh, it's been a very, very um, active year, uh, and I will uh, put a document together, and I was telling Mr. Begley I should have that to you by the end of the week, so you can actually start getting the information and kind of see exactly uh, the kind of thing that you'll be um, deliberating as you uh, start going through the process. So um, we're in a unique situation where um, there are seven members on the committee, and there are, all seven of you will be um, in place after the election. So yeah. in years past, we, were, we had new members, so it was one of those things where we, my evaluation would be complete prior to the election. Right. Well, what I'd like to do is just make sure that we keep the rigor of sticking to the um, schedule only because next year that may not be true. Sure, and absolutely. We just want to get people mindset that we want to turn these things around quickly yeah. and we want to have them in time uh, you know, for our next meeting. So with that said, uh, expect some information from me. I will provide an update to you on uh, our next meeting as to uh, where we are with our goals. Like I said, um, what I can do, the, if you look back to our meeting earlier this year, um, you have an, up, um, an update in February, I believe, but the form that I give you with my uh, end of year update or status update to this point of the year, it'll have both the, the February update and it'll also have this update. So you'll have a cumulative of, of the first and, 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 and the last. Mid-year and full year. Mid -year and, yes, absolutely. And, and then you'll have some, um, like I said, the other document that I u typically provide, which is um, uh, bulleted lists and, and items that we've worked on this year that are relative to, to my work. Okay? 
And, and you're going to have that Thursday, you said? By, th yeah, by Thursday, yeah. So they'll have that Thursday, and we have the Word document allows you to go in and put in your comments and everything. So you'll have this supporting information on Thursday. So that'll give you the weekend, two weekends and a full week um, to get, actually, less than that. Because I want to be able... I want to be able to have the feedback um, so that I can consolidate it and have the document for everyone's review on the 15th. Go ahead. So then how long do you need to compile it? Because it has to be on... Yeah, just I just need a few days to do it. Okay. Last year was a problem because I yeah. had mm -hmm. business needs that were, had me out of town, but th that's not an issue this year. So mm -hmm. um, if if you could just... We'll get the information on the 4th mm -hmm. and um, add that to what's already here. Go through what's already here just to refresh you on uh, what the goals were and, and, importantly, all the measure by. Mm -hmm. um, as measured by is included on each one of the goals. You want to stress that, start getting your mind around that, how you would word, um, you know, just some bullet it. This supports this, mm -hmm. this supports this. And he's going to provide us with a full list. And then uh, you probably, in years past, um, Dr. Maestas usually has so many things that um, he leaves things off his list because he's humble. <laughs> and, and I'll sit there and I'll say, oh, what about this? I remember this, and I remember this, and I'll add a few more in there. Or uh, uh, So uh, anyway, I want everyone to get their... And we and I expect um, to have that input from everybody, mm -hmm. right? I try not to have it as um, a, a text or a, a fast email. Everybody respond using the new state document, please. Okay. Bye. Okay. By by the tenth. How's that? That's what I figured. Enough time for everyone. By the tenth. Good. Okay. And then we're going to meet on the 15th, the 16th, and the 22nd. So we have some. Yeah, Mr. Bailey, just to remind everybody, the 16th is the meeting with the selectmen. The selectmen. And that's Tuesday. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Very good. Very good. The probably have a meeting yeah. There's something else going on, I think. And we have other... It wasn't us. It, was, it, was, uh, it wasn't it our was, request. It's booked. It's well, booked up. Well, they have up. a meeting that night at 7, right, across the street? Probably. I would think so. Don't they meet on Tuesday? Yeah, they do, but I don't know if they meet that night. I think they meet every Tuesday. Every Tuesday. Well, every Tuesday. Tuesday. I think they, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I don't know. <laughs> Okay. Now we're to uh, school fundraisers. Anybody have any questions or feedback? Dr. Campbell, anything you want to point that out? Or? From last week. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> we are um, encouraging some folks to get their gross and net receipts in more expeditiously. Let's put it that way. Okay. <laughs> Ongoing process. Okay. Uh, reports and proposals from committee members. Ms. Hunt? Um, I just have a, a few small things. I um, attended the North School Council meeting. I'm actually a parent rep, not a school committee rep on Plymouth North School Council. And um, amongst other things, we did discuss the 13 reasons why. So I'm really glad that this, this came out today. Um, and one thing that I wanted to mention about that, and I know I've talked to a few people and some people watched it over the weekend. Um, I watched it because I came home and found out that my daughter already watched it and I knew nothing about it. Um, and at the meeting at Plymouth North School Council, there are two um, people on the committee that were, are actually um, school counselors in other districts. And one of them, when we came home, she sent me a text message and she said, I just talked to my daughter and she watched it, and I had no idea. And A, how does my daughter binge watch 13 hours of anything?
without us walk knowing. Um, so I think that that's really important that this letter went out because I think a lot of us parents are finding out that our kids already watched it because what they're doing is they're encouraging us to watch it with our kids. But I think once we ask the questions, we're finding out that a lot of the high school age kids and some middle school kids have already watched it. So it, it was, it was very good, but it was very disturbing to me. So, and I, I know Michelle watched it over the weekend and. So it's which, what was this yeah. you were watching? It's a Netflix series. It's the one that Dr. Maes has talked about earlier. Um, so that was one thing. And then the other thing is um, I attended on Sunday the Indivisible Plymouth meeting. Um, and uh, it was very good. It's the second one I've been to. They meet every month. It was at the Spire Center because it grew out of the space at the library. Um, and it's it's intended to be a nonpartisan, basically for people of Plymouth and surrounding communities that just want to know how to make a change if they're not happy with the way things are. Um, so one of the things that they made is they made a voter um, information sheet, which I have here. Any, they sent out que questionnaires to all the candidates um, who are opposed. And they made this sheet. They're also um, trying to get the word out to all the precincts to have a voter turnout because I think that there's one district that is, I think, eight times more voter turnout yes. than all the rest of the districts. <laughs> mm -hmm. yep. um, so they're really encouraging everybody in Plymouth to get out there and vote. Um, another thing is part of this meeting is you, when you get there, you, you sit by precinct. And they talk about different ways that you can get involved, things that are happening around the country, things are happening in Plymouth. And then the second half of the meeting is you actually break out into focus uh, interest groups. And there's an education interest group, which I joined last month. They were really excited that I was there because they had a lot of questions. They also talked about sending our district or Dr. Maestas maybe a questionnaire of their own about some things that they're concerned with in education, not only in our district, but state and, and federal. So I did, they did ask me again about that. So I, I told them that if they ever wanted, I could extend an invitation to Dr. Maestas if he was available. Maybe he could come and answer questions. Or if they did have something, I'm sure that he would be willing to answer the questions that they have. And then the other thing is um, they really were interested. One of the parents, I don't know what school she was from, one of the people in this group had mentioned the backpack program. And they were very interested in that. And they want to support it and get behind it. So I think that they're looking for more information on that program as well. So it was a really good meeting. I was glad. You know, sometimes on a sat Sunday afternoon, I'm like, ah, maybe I won't go. But um, I was glad that I went. And then the last thing is I wanted to mention, kind of piggybacks on what Dr. Sorensen said about um, sending information to our federal legislators that on May 20th, which is Election Day, there's a rally for public education on Boston Common. And I'm planning on being there with PTA. Um, but it is going to, one of the things that they, the rally is for is for full funding for ESSA. Um, for debt-free debt higher education, less testing, more learning, and equitable access to education for all. So that's going to be May 20th on the Boston Common. That's it. Very good. Ms. Badger, you had your hand up. Yeah. Um, I since the trend. Oh, no, no. I thought it may have been a response to her. Um, so where was I? So for the first time since we did a transition from uh, since I took over the Pilgrimary Collaborative in January, I was able to attend a meeting. Mm -hmm. January they had a meeting. I was away for work. February I was ready to go, like almost in my car, and they canceled it. Um, and so this month they had one, and there's just some interesting discussion that we had, which I had from when I was on last year, they mentioned that they are going to, in fact, have an extended day next fall, which is really good, but will impact busing and other things like that. But they said they've reached out to all the districts, so I, I hope they have. Um, they're, again, having the same issues of space that the Pilgrimary Collaborative has had in the past, you know, no consistent building, so that's been a problem for them. Um, but they're also going to, they're taking a look at their cost structure and what they charge districts and right, 
there's been a trend where they're you know they're trying to catch up but they've been in the negative and yes they have a kitty that they're required by the state to have but they're they're going to increase their costs to better kind of place themselves within the year so they know where they are at different points during the year and then also to find a lot of people wonder like what the pilgrim area collaborative is what they do they actually filmed on april 26th they a couple pieces for pack tv and so that'll they should be start airing uh, they said sometime in the next week to give the public a little bit more insight into the academy and other por portions of the collaborative so that's that piece. Um, we've got the Alumni Association. We have our next meeting on May 25th at 6 o'clock. Um, we're really working towards some, um, what are we calling it? What's the word? The, um, it's like the Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame, but, but not awards. Or not ex not alumni athletic. awards. Not alumni athletics. awards, yes. Yeah. Um, I, yes, did binge watch um, 13 Reasons Why while I was cleaning and doing a lot of work. So I didn't just sit in front of the TV, I promise. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, again, I mentioned this last couple times, Pan Mass Kid Ride is on June 25th and should be a lot of fun. So that's it. Wow. Dr. Sorensen. Uh, yeah, in terms of the uh, proposal, um, Every year at the National School Board Conference, there's the uh, Sodeco Awards, whereby districts across the country are, are uh, recognized for a particular program or a particular achievement. And there's a good, good chunk of money that's attached to that. And uh, I remember when I went with Mr. Gordon and I was there with Ms. Hunt and Ms. And Ms. Burgess, we often talked about what we have, great, we have great programs here. So which one could reach that level? For example, one of the ones that won last year was a, 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 a version of the backpack program. It was whereby a student, actually, a school system actually got a van and they filled it with the food and then they drove the van to the poorer sections of the city and distributed it. I'm not suggesting we do that, but you, know, but you know what? This preparation for 2020 is K through 12. We heard it tonight in this building. We're doing videos, we're, doing, we're, we're connecting classrooms, we're writing, we're writing. I really believe that yeah. this rises to the level mm -hmm. of national recognition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Maestas. Every time people mention the awards, I get a little bit of a, of a reaction because I submitted three different applications in, in three consecutive years for our solar work. And um, we got shot down three years in a row and I, I, I was very disappointed um, and at the time, we were the only ones really going down that road. Yes. Um, but I, I like the idea of the 400th because it's very unique. Right. It is a landmark moment. Right. All of the awards that I have seen <coughs> have students involved in them. Yeah. Now, there may be technological sure. and there may be solar, but all yeah. the ones I have seen, yeah. students have been involved. Yeah. So that's a different type of presentation. The one, the, the one that I was... Um, that I was going after was uh, school committee motivated awards. So mm -hmm. how the mm -hmm. school committee were impact had impacted uh, a school district's mm -hmm. uh, direction, and and that was the uh, uh, category that I was going after. But I think the idea mm -hmm. of the 400th is, is well, tremendous. Well, one of the one of the uh, one of the themes that all the winners seem to have is it's it's universal across the school system. Mm -hmm. It has a lot, in, and this is exactly what we're doing yeah. here. This is not one classroom or one school. Those are the ones that seem to win. The, the other thing, too, is we have uh, demonstrated evidence as to how the, the progress that we've made. You know, the kid, a lot of kids' involvement. Uh, we have students traveling there. We have students from England traveling here. Right. Um, yeah. And that long-term collaboration, I mm -hmm. think, is, is perfect for that. A good mm -hmm. suggestion. We should look at it. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Mrs. Burgess, do you have anything? What? Uh, reports. Oh, well, the next one. N no, I know that. I'm asking oh, no, you under. Not on this. No. Okay. I don't. You jump ahead of me here. No. <laughs> PYDC. Yeah, that's coming up. Uh, so, we, <coughs> huh? Yeah, May 12th, I believe. Yeah, okay, yeah. On oh, May yeah, 12th. Yeah. We so have that's a, all. We again. have an old entry there. And I didn't, the, I couldn't uh, get to, I was trying to go to the district one, but I had a, something else that night. So, uh, but it's I think it's the same as what we have anyway, oh, yeah, isn't it? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's a repeat. The district it was in Middleborough. 
Oh, the, the, um, about the, um, Beware DC, the, well, it's the different. Substance, the substance abuse prevention, the collaborative that you're doing yeah. with PYD. Yeah, yeah, right. Yes, that is. Um, that was on the 27th of April. Yeah, I was trying to get to it, but it just didn't the work out. In Middleborough, yeah. yeah, correct. Okay, building committee. And the building committee is going to be on the 11th. Oh, boy, we just picked up a few minutes on our that, agenda. That's two, <laughs> two times in a row, one night and the next morning early. Yeah, <laughs> Personnel reports, Mrs. Fry. Yes, um, we have a number of different appointments, um, two certificated appointments, um, four coach and advisor appointments, five classified appointments, um, one leave of absence, and seven resignations. So we're really ramping up, and um, we have a new system for hiring that we're very excited about, and thanks to all the principals and staff who are working on that, the workflow. Gary loves when I say workflow. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's going well. Very good, thank you. Ms. Badger, the uh, warrant? Thank you, thank you, moving. Okay, here we go. Where school committee members have been provided with a copy of the cost center transfer and transaction summary report and warrant for review, I move that the Plymouth School Committee accept and approve the reports and accounts payable warrant S050417 dated May 4th, 2017 in the amount of $406,878.29 as presented. Thank you. Second is by Dr. Sorensen. <laughs> Any further discussion? Then please vote. We're all connected tonight, I think, right? Yes. I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm just all staring at you. It's okay. <laughs> oh, I can't move. Sorry about that. It's okay. Yeah, unanimous. <laughs> and that brings us to normally I have this printed out, so I apologize for the hesitations. So that brings us to the end of our regular meeting agenda. We're going to go into executive session if I can get a motion to do so, uh, Ms. Badger. I move that the school committee go into executive session for the purpose of discuss, discussing strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation. And it, uh, do I have to read that? If an, if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and the chair pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A3. Okay. okay, and seconded by Mrs. Burgess. This is a roll call vote, so we'll start down at the bottom and come right on on around. Yes? Yes. Yes? Yes. 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 I voted, and, and I'll say it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's up on the vote. You can prefer to vote. You're quick. Okay, so we're going to go into executive session. That's, this brings an end to our regular meeting being broadcast. We'll only be returning to adjourn later on. Oh, yeah, we voted as no, we, we voted as a yeah, right there. but we voted as a roll call but Sorry, I, I thought we, we didn't go to, uh, Mr. Harold's conference room which is down the hall. Wait, I didn't get a chance to hit my